about five seconds. You can start, Dr. Sai. Okay. Good evening uh, to all in India. A late good evening to uh, Dr. Gangadhar Sundar in, in Singapore. And a very, very good morning to, to uh, those in, in the UK and the US. Maybe it's mid-afternoon in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and welcome uh, to this uh, seventh session of our worldwide ophthalmology revisions, which we have planned over three days. Uh, this is the last session, and uh, what a session it's, it's going to be. Packed with legends in the field of oculoplasty, ocular oncology, and tumors. So what a grand finale we are having. We are indeed very, very happy that you could find time to join us uh, today for this. Uh, and I welcome each and every one of you uh, to this uh, session. Uh, I request Dr. Gopal to briefly introduce Dr. Santosh, who is chairing the session, uh, along with uh, Marian, Ani, and Fairos, and then we will move forward. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sai. I hope you can hear me. I'm Dr. Gopal Pillai. I'm Secretary of the Cochin of Talmi Club. So this is our program today, Star Studded Program. Uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Carol Shields, Damato, Fairus, Santoshunavar, Gangadhar Sundar, Michael Kasim, Grover, and Dr. Ushakim. So uh, Dr. Santoshunavar, as was already said, doesn't require any introduction in India or abroad. He's a director of Department of Oculoplasty and Ocular Oncology, Center for Sight, Hyderabad, and is a director of the National Retinoblastoma Foundation. He is a former associate director of LV Prasada Institute Hyderabad and currently the chief editor of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and Indian Journal of Ophthalmology Case Reports, both of which have grown really uh, very much after Santosh has taken charge. So he is a senior achievement award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology, Shivaradi International Award from the All India Ophthalmic Society, Shanti Swarup Patnagar Award by the Government of India, Jerry Shields International Award, APAO 2019, and Lifetime Achievement Award by American Academy of Ophthalmology. Annie Sridhar is uh, uh, our moderator. Uh, she would be a senior consultant of oculoplasty and neuro-ophthalmology at Little Flower Multi-Speciality after having MBPS uh, from Trishur Medical College and MS from Calicut Medical College. Uh, also completed one year general surgery, working in a multi-speciality tertiary care hospital Little Flower Hospital on Gamali. Started the first full-fledged Oculo uh, Plastic Clinic in Kerala in 2005 and uh, mentored under Dr. Santosh and uh, uh, wife to Dr. Ashok Meno. Dr. Marian, Senior Consultant and Head, Oculoplasty, Orbit, Ocular Oncology and Ocular Prosthesis at Giridharai Hospital, Kuchi. She is MS from the Kerala University and DNB from National Board, two years clinical fellowship, Orbit Oculoplasty Trauma Reconstructive Aesthetic Surgery from Shankar Netralaya, Ocular Oncology Fellowship from Wilsai Hospital US, and past Basic Sciences and Clinical Sciences from the ICO in 2007. Uh, a recipient of the Jaibin uh, Chamanel Rasha uh, Gold Medal for the Best Outgoing Subspecialty Fellow from Shankar Netralaya Chennai, and a recipient of Dr. Ganga Darsundar Award for the Young Oculoplastic Surgeon from Shankar Netralaya. So these are my our moderators. Uh, I would have uh, 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 I would give the podium to uh, Dr. Santosh, Marian, and Annie, and they will in turn welcome the others. Over to you. Thank you, Gopal, for the nice introduction. We'll have the first talk. Marian, can you please introduce Dr. Carol? Yes. Um, hope my slides are visible. Not yet. Please okay. share your screen. Yeah. Hope my slides are visible. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning and good evening to all. It's my great honor and great privilege to introduce Dr. Carol L. Shields. She is the director of Ocular Oncology Services at Wilsai Hospital, Philadelphia. And as well as she is the professor of ophthalmology at Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia. More than that, she has authored and co-authored 12 textbooks, over 1,400 articles in major journals, and over 300 textbook chapters, and over more, 
more than uh, 700 lectureships. And she is the recipient of many prestigious awards. I'm not going to list out all the things, but the few important things, the Amer a American Academy of Ophthalmology Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011. And she is in the Ophthalmology Power List in 2014, 16, 18, 20, 21. And she's currently the president of Macula Society also. And it's my, uh, it was great honor to be with her for a three months uh, ICF fellowship with Dr. Shields in the year 2017. Over to you, Dr. Shields, for your great lecture. Dr. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, sorry about this slight delay. I'm just going to get my talk up. Yes. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for that nice introduction. It is really a great pleasure to be a part of this symposium. Um, I have no financial disclosures. <clears throat> In the next 20 minutes, I'd like to talk to you about vascular tumors of the retina and choroid. So this involves tumors of the retina, including hemangioblastoma, which might be seen with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, cavernous hemangioma, which could be seen with retinal brain cavernous hemangiomatosis, racemos hemangioma seen in Wyburn-Mason syndrome, vasoproliferative tumor that can be seen with a multitude of different syndromes, including neurofibromatosis type one, and then diffuse choroidal hemangioma seen with Sturge-Weber syndrome and circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, which has no systemic associations. Let's begin with retinal hemangioblastoma. This typically appears as a red-orange retinal mass anywhere in the fundus, associated with exudation, subretinal fluid, occasional epiretinal membrane, and cystoid macular edema. As mentioned previously, this can be related to von Hippel-Lindau disease. Now, if a patient has a history of von Hippel-Lindau disease, all they need is one retinal hemangioblastoma to confirm the diagnosis that they too carry the disease. If they don't have a family history of von Hippel-Lindau disease, then they need two or more retinal hemangioblastomas to suggest underlying von Hippel-Lindau disease. And von Hippel-Lindau disease has a multitude of findings, including retinal and cerebellar hemangioblastomas, spinal cord hemangioblastomas, and then malignancies such as renal cell carcinoma. About 50% of patients with this syndrome have only one feature. So a very nice review was written in the journal Retina 2019 by Dr. Arenal and colleagues on von Hippel-Lindau disease update on pathogenesis and systemic aspects. This disease is related to the HIF hypoxia inducible factor alpha pathway. Normally in normal oxygen, this pathway flows nicely and HIF is degraded. When there's low oxygen, the pathway flows to the point that the HIF persists and stimulates VEGF. Patients with von Hippel-Lindau disease have a mutation in this pathway to the point that they constantly produce HIF alpha, and then that stimulates the development of tumors. It's estimated in the US there are about 7,000 patients with this syndrome. The average age of retinal hemangioblastoma is 24 years, cerebellar tumor 26 years, and renal cell carcinoma 60 years for a mean life survival of about 50 years. So I've shown you this picture before, but I just want you to understand sometimes the exudation is very subtle as in this picture, and the fluid is quite subtle. And you can see on fluorescein and endocyanine green angiography, this tumor lights up. And on OCT, it's within the retina, and it usually causes subretinal fluid or intraretinal edema. It can be located near the disc or in the periphery, 
And we have many different ways to treat it, including laser, photodynamic therapy, or cryotherapy. For example, here's a small tumor that we treated with surrounding laser and the patient did well. A little larger, most more posterior tumor treated with photodynamic therapy before showing the subretinal fluid and then after showing resolution of the subretinal fluid and scarring and fibrosis of the hemangioblastoma. Another tumor located near the disc with exudative maculopathy. This is a very subtle hemangioblastoma showing before with the intraretinal exudation and then after plus additional anti-VEGF because the patient developed an exudative response into the vitreous. But we can see that the fluid in the retina on OCT has responded. Now, how well does PDT do for retinal hemangioblastoma? This was just published by Dina Kola and colleagues in Ophthalmology Retina just this past month, 2021. So we looked at 18 hemangioblastomas in 17 eyes. The mean basal diameter was 3.5 millimeters and thickness two millimeters. Exudation, fluid, and edema was seen in most patients. And it took on average one to two sessions to completely eradicate the tumor. And post PDT exudative response was seen in 24% of eyes. So you have to be prepared for anti-VEGF. Overall, we achieved tumor control in 72% of cases and the visual acuity remains stable or improved in 71% of cases. So PDT is effective for juxtapapillary and peripheral hemangioblastomas, providing tumor control and visual stabilization, but it doesn't work in all patients. Here you can see a patient on the top showing the OCT before and after with resolution of the fluid, and then on the bottom showing the exudative maculopathy before and after with good results. Here's one who had a scary finding. We did PDT, she got exudative retinal detachment. We had to give anti-VEGF and then all settled down. And you can see her OCT settled down too. And she remains under control to this point. Now, Hess et al. has published on systemic findings with von Hippel Lindau. They are numerous, including retinal, inner ear, cerebellar, liver, pancreas, adrenal gland, kidney, and epididymis tumors. So these patients need a systemic oncologist to oversee them. And Mary Erin now looked at the genetic mutations in von Hippel-Lindau. Three of the four different genetic mutations in include retinal hemangioblastoma. So when we see a patient with retinal hemangioblastoma, we always send them for genetic evaluation. Now I pause for a second. There is new information on a new therapy for retinal hemangioblastoma and other tumors in VHL. And this new therapy is called belzutifan. This was just released at ARVO 2021. This is an oral medication, 120 milligrams per day. It's a HIF hypoxia inducible factor blockage. It blocks HIF 2 alpha from converting into HIF 1 beta. And here you can see one of the cases in the series. This patient had a retinal hemangioblastoma with vitreous fibrosis. After six weeks, it looked no better. But after 49 weeks, the tumor was undergoing involution. Case number 11, again, baseline, it's a classic hemangioblastoma. Week 13, it's getting a little bit more regressed. And week 40, it's regressed beautifully. You can imagine just putting a little laser on that tumor to control it permanently. And another case number four, juxtapapillary tumor before, after six weeks, and at week 49, beautifully regressed. This is not yet commercially available. It's still under study, but this is the newest information now with von Hippel-Lindau disease. This works not just for the eye findings, but for the renal cell carcinoma. So when their study uh, of the 29 eyes, 97% were improved or stable, and of the participants, 94% were improved or stable. So keep your eye out for this medication once it becomes FDA available. I'll just say minor uh, comments on the remainder of the tumors. Cavernous hemangioma looks like a, a bunch of Concord grapes, usually centered around the epicenter of the vein, paravenous, that can occur over and on the disc. 
it can produce vitreous hemorrhage and pre-retinal fibrosis. Here's one patient we saw, she had skin, brain, and retinal cavernous hemangiomatosis. And you can have brain malformations and it can lead to short limbs, paralysis, and even stroke. And you can see her right arm was malformed because of the brain cavernous hemangioma. This can be re related to mutations on chromosome seven and chromosome three. And these genes encode for cerebral cavernous malformation. It's also known as the CRIT1 gene. She was a marathon runner and she developed a stroke from the brain cavernoma that bled. Occasionally, these can be very subtle and notice that youth at birth, this young child was referred to us for potential shaken baby syndrome. And in the fundus, you can see in the right eye, there were numerous RPE hyperplasia with hemorrhages, but actually this proved to be a cavernous hemangioma and not shaken baby syndrome. Now we'll move on to racemose hemangioma, which is the most striking of these tumors. This can occur in the retina, midbrain, and in the mandible. There's an archer classification, one, two, and three. This would be an archer three with markedly dilated vessels, and you cannot identify the artery from the brain. These patients are at risk for branch or central retinal vein obstruction and vascular sclerosis, but more importantly, they need a brain MRI because they are at risk for stroke and they can have bleeding from mandibular uh, tumor. Here's an unusual case that uh, came from India, Kaliki et al., where they showed a patient who had bilateral epipapillary racemose hemangiomatosis. And then you can see here on fluorescein angiography, the extent of this racemose hemangiomatosis at the optic disc, which is untreatable. Vasoproliferative tumor is another retinal vascular tumor. It is primary in 75% of cases and secondary in 25% of cases. This looks a lot like hemangioblastoma, except there's no dilated retinal vessels. This can produce macular exudation, epimacular uh, membrane. So here you see a primary tumor ill-defined on the left, and then a secondary tumor in an eye with retinitis pigmentosa. Jerry Shields was the first to describe this tumor. He called it presumed acquired retinal hemangiomas back in 1983, and they described 12 patients. Later, we looked at 103 patients and identified the primary versus the secondary etiologies. And the secondary etiologies include, most often, retinitis pigmentosa, pars planitis, toxoplasmosis, toxocara, Coates disease. And then later, we looked at 334 cases, and we identified that the tumor can be primary in 80%, secondary in 20%, and the secondary vasoproliferative tumor is more often bilateral, multiple, larger, in young children with poor vision. So an interesting tumor with lots that we have learned over the years. Here's a plate of six primary tumors. Notice how ill-defined this tumor is and it produces sectoral exudation. Here's one that, we, that had um, exudative retinal detachment that we treated with cryotherapy before and after showing the scarring with resolution. And another one in an artist who had a large vasoproliferative tumor, exudative retinopathy, not yet at the macula, treated with photodynamic therapy. Lastly, we'll finish with choroidal vascular tumors. Choroidal hemangioma tends to occur in the Sturge-Weber syndrome. It's usually diffuse, and these patients come in with nevus flamius, rubrochoria, that is red pupil, and they can have glaucoma, choroidal hemangioma, and retinal detachment. There's a multitude of fe features with this syndrome also, seizures, hemiparesis, hemianopia, headaches, Development, developmental delay, glaucoma, and what we deal with, choroidal hemangioma in 40% of cases. This is the most difficult to see tumor in the fundus. You look in the fundus, it looks red, but you don't really see a tumor until you do an ultrasound. This tumor can produce total retinal detachment and it's best imaged on ultrasound. There's the tumor and here's the ultra, uh, OCT. You can see in this time domain OCT, the choroid is elevated, depressed, elevated. There's a tumor in the choroid 
and the retina is folded upon itself with subretinal fluid. We have a few management options for this, but we strongly prefer low dose plaque radiotherapy. It's one and done treatment. And here you can see we've marked the tumor on the episclera. We place the plaque under the muscle. It gives a dose of 30 gray or 25 gray to the apex. That's low dose. And here you can see before the echo dense diffuse choroidal hemangioma and after it's completely gone and the retinal detachment is gone, leaving RPE alterations. And another case before you can see the retinal detachment inferiorly and then after low dose radiotherapy, the detachment is gone and the tumor has involuted. We have never seen recurrence after plaque radiotherapy for choroidal, diffuse choroidal hemangioma. And Arapelli et al. has published on this in the journal Ophthalmology. Last, we'll say a few words about circumscribed choroidal hemangioma. Again, this is another one of these difficult to detect, often misdiagnosed tumors. It's an orange mass deep to the retina, and it almost always measures the same size, six millimeters in base, three millimeters in thickness. It's not bigger, it's not smaller. Here you can see the average echo dense ultrasound and on fluorescein it tends to has a, a lacy early and bright uh, fluorescein uh, angiogram. We looked at endocyanine green angiography of choroidal tumors and the only tumor that stands out as different is choroidal hemangioma. It's the only tumor that fills rapidly and early and then has a late washout. Later, Aravello et al. looked at a series of 25 choroidal hemangiomas using ICG. And he found these show hyperfluorescence, usually by 27 seconds up to 222 seconds. So it's early, usually by one or two minutes, they're very hyperfluorescent. And here we see the washout occurs later on, late after the, the dye leaves the eye. So here you can see in, from his paper, Plate A showing the early hyperfluorescence by one minute, it's maximum. And usually by about 10 minutes, you see that washout of the fluorescence. This tumor tends to be smooth in configuration. It's often located near the fovea. You can see it right here. Now, if it produces subretinal fluid, we need to treat it. Here's the tumor on OCT and the intraretinal and subretinal fluid on OCT. So we looked at circumscribed choroidal hemangioma published last year in ophthalmology retina, looking at the pre-PDT versus PDT era in 458 cases that we treated. And interestingly, we found in the pre-PDT era, the average outcome visual acuity was 20 over 400. In the PDT era, the average visual outcome is 20 over 63. So PDT protects vision better than the pre-PDT uh, alternatives. So we PDT these tumors if there is vi uh, vision threatening fluid. So you can see in the top panel, there's the tumor we treated with PDT. And then in the bottom panel, you can see the tumor has resolved and the subretinal fluid has resolved on OCT leaving, leaving 20, 20 vision. Another case showing the tumor treated with PDT right through the fovea. And then in the bottom panel, you can see the tumor and believe it or not, the tumor is completely gone, but we did develop a little RPE alterations leaving 2070 vision, but at least we don't have to worry about chronic subretinal fluid. So in summary, we've talked about retina hemangioblastoma. Don't forget about belzutifan. This will be commercially available and it's good not only for the eye, but for the systemic renal cell carcinoma. Talked about cavernous and racemose hemangioma, vasoproliferative tumor, and diffuse and circumscribed choroidal tumors. Thank you for allowing me to speak on vascular tumors of the fundus. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Uh, it was a very wonderful spectrum. We covered the whole spectrum of uh, vascular tumors of the fundus. Uh, now let's move on to the next uh, talk and then share. No, we can have some amount of discussion, discussion after each yeah. talk so that okay. that will be covered. Dr. Andy, can I ask a question to Dr. Carroll? Yes. Sure, uh, fine. Okay. 
All right, yeah. Hi, Dr. Carol, as always, excellent, excellent presentation. So it's regarding the application of PDT as a treatment modality in uh, retinal capillary hemangioblastoma. So, uh, well, we do have PDT in India, but it's a bit more expensive when compared to other laser therapies. Uh, so what do you think is the indication of transpupillary thermotherapy in uh, capillary uh, hemangioblastoma? Yeah, TTT, transpupillary thermotherapy, would be a good alternative. It leaves a little more scarring, but these eyes are pretty scarred anyways from the tumor. And one thing you might consider is ICG-enhanced TTT, mm -hmm. because when we used to treat amelanotic melanoma a lot with TTT, if it was amelanotic with no pigment, we would give ICG, because that's a chromophore, and that would make our TTT more effective. And the group in South America, Costa et al., he's also used ICG enhanced TTT. He calls it thermoablation, mm -hmm. ICG enhanced TTT for retinal vascular tumors. So yes, I think it is a good alternative. You're gonna definitely get a scar where you put it, but your main goal is to dry up macular exudation and fluid. So if you leave a scar outside the macula, no big deal. Um, so that's a good alternative. If you happen to do laser and laser's not getting it, um, another little trick we use is fluorescein enhanced mm -hmm. laser photocoagulation. Michael Gorin, who's now on the West Coast of the US, talked about this years ago uh, for treatment of uh, hemangioblastomas. You give fluorescein angiography like one or two minutes before you do your laser, and then you do your laser and you get a much uh, greater uptake. Is there any uh, indication for cryotherapy in this, uh, Dr. Karen? Absolutely, absolutely. So if the tumor is anterior to the equator, <clears throat> I always keep it in my you know, list of alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, the one risk of doing cryo is uh, you might get an exudative response and you could get a vitreous hemorrhage. But as Dr. Farouz showed us, if the patient has an epiretinal membrane in the macula yeah. and they have a peripheral retinal hemangioblastoma and you do cryotherapy, you might spontaneously peel that epiretinal membrane with your cryo. So your cryo is doing two things. It's controlling the tumor and it can cause shrinkage of the vitreous and peel the membrane. I think you had, what, 60% of ERM spontaneously peeled after cryo. Yes, yes. That was a paper from a long time ago. Yes, it was in 2013, 12, I think, yeah. yeah. And Dr. Carol, one last question for you. Uh, what is your experience with oral propranolol in choroidal hemangioma, be it diffuse or uh, circumscribed? Yeah, so Hatem Krema wrote a paper in one of the major journals saying oral propranolol does not work for diffuse choroidal hemangioma. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of guts to write that paper. He based it on a series of two. We have a series of three. It did not work in any case. Okay. I co-authored a paper from Nepal where they did use it and it did work. So I'm not saying it doesn't work ever, but I'm not a big fan of it. All right. Thank you so much. Because while these kids are on it, their vision's getting worse and worse. And you know, all you have to do is place a little low dose plaque and their oh. vision would improve. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can we move on to the next talk? Dr. Gopal? Yes. Yeah. yeah, please. If there aren't any other questions, are there any other points to discuss by any one of you? Dr. Santosh? Dr. Grover is here. Hi, Dr. Grover. Good evening. Dr. Tomato? You. Next Any team. other points to discuss? I yeah, think we covered everything. Yeah, I okay. think so great. Nice. Yeah. Maybe one last point to make. Um, one alternative for hemangioblastoma I didn't discuss was endoresection. I have seen some beautiful responses to endoresection for large uh, posterior hemangioblastomas. And I also didn't discuss plaque radiotherapy. I sort of don't like using it, but it does work 
for peripheral hemangioblastomas. But endoresection is an alternative if you have a real slick uh, vitrectomist who's comfortable with oil in the eye. Uh, Bertil, your, your yeah. experience with that? Dr. D'Amato is a great... <laughs> a great <laughs> surgeon. surgeon. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't me that treated them, but my colleagues got good success with some of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, then uh, we can, can you see on. my slide? I can't go into the uh, our uh, Pra Praveena, can you share the slides, please? Next. Praveena, can you share your slide? Thanks. Am I visible now, Dr. Gopal? Yes, uh, Dr. Yes. Ani, you can okay. introduce Dr. Yes. Yes. Go ahead and introduce I just doctors. went off the, yeah. Uh, Dr. Bertel is a senior research, a clinical research fellow of the Newfield uh, Laboratory of Ophthalmology at University of Oxford. He is also a consultant on ocular oncologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital, London, and uh, Professor Emeritus uh, of Ophthalmology and Radiation Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco. And he has served as a president of the International Society of Ocular Oncology, and he has uh, and uh, also of the European uh, Ophthalmic Oncology Group. And he has published more than 300 articles in uh, various scientific journals, and he has co-edited uh, several textbooks. Uh, now over to Dr. Bertil. Hello, I'm delighted to be here. Can you see my title slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. very much. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, this meeting is reminding me of a wonderful time we spent in Kerala when our son as a medical student was studying in India. So oh, okay. that's great. Yeah. So I'm going to give a quick update on uveal melanoma. And um, presentation age is usually around the age of 60, although there's quite a widespread. And in our series, the male female ratio was about one to one. About 90% of uveal melanomas involve the choroid and the rest arise in ciliary body and or iris. Predisposing factors are congenital ocular melanocytosis, melanocytoma, and recently uh, the BAP1 tumor predisposition syndrome. And that increases the scope of getting a family history from these patients if they report renal cell carcinoma, mesothelioma, melanomas and other tumors. Advances have occurred in imaging, wide field imaging, and tear segment imaging have greatly improved the management of these patients. Fluorescence imaging, um, angiography, ICG to differentiate from other tumors, and especially autofluorescence imaging that shows up a lipofuscin pigment on the surface of these tumors. Ultrasonography continues to improve, A scan, especially B scan, and OCT, especially EDI OCT, has really improved the imaging of small posterior tumors. Biopsy techniques have advanced, not only in the surgical theater, but also in the laboratory. The immunohistochemistry, the genetic studies have greatly improved over the years. Now, Carol and Jerry Shields have devised the TFSOM system for differentiating choroidal nevi from melanomas 
And that's extremely important. It's, it's really transformed the management of these patients around the world, and it's a very, very valuable tool. It requires, however, OC, um, ultrasonography, which um, optometrists and ophthalmologists in the community may not have access to. And therefore, I've designed the MOLES acronym to help distinguish choroidal moles, nevi, from melanomas. M for mushroom shape, orange pigment, L for large size, E for enlargement, and S for subretinal fluid. And this helps um, non-experts to distinguish choroidal nevi from melanomas to some extent. And then when they see a specialist with ultrasonography, then they move on to the TFSOM system, which is great. Treatment. The big question is, does ocular treatment influence survival of patients with uveal melanoma? And if so, in whom? That's been a matter of debate for centuries. But here's a patient who greatly influenced me. This was at a time when it was believed that ocular treatment did not influence survival. And so we watched this patient because she had diabetes and radiotherapy would have affected her vision. And after several years, her tumor suddenly grew. So we removed the eye and we did genetic analysis on the base of the tumor, the old part of the tumor, which showed no lethal mutations, and the apex of the tumor, which showed very dangerous mutations associated with metastasis. And after this case was published, this patient developed metastasis and died. And so this one case convinces me that in, at least in some cases, early treatment may prevent metastasis. Now we'll speak about the different therapeutic modalities, focusing on the advances. Transpapillary thermotherapy, really good for small tumors, ex accepting that it's not as reliable as radiotherapy, let's say very elderly patients and so on, on the understanding that we might need to give radiotherapy if the tumor recurs. Vertiporfin deriv uh, derivative therapy, PDT, useful in some patients, but has got a high recurrence rate. And recently, there's interest in Aura 011, which is injected in the suprachoroidal space, and then laser treatment is given, cold laser, as I like to call it. And But early results are encouraging, but more data need, are needed. Iodine brachytherapy is uh, extremely popular in many countries, particularly in the United States. And when I was there, I was really impressed with the eye physics plaque treatment, where the plaque is customized for each patient using 3D printing. And you tell eye physics when you want to put the plaque in, when you want to take it out, and they make a plaque specially for you. And they send it to you by courier and you use it and then you send it back. And it, it's really wonderful with highly collimated brachytherapy. In Britain, we tend to use ruthenium plaque radiotherapy, which gives beta rays, which uh, don't travel so far. So there's less risk of collateral damage to optic nerve and fovea. The standard practice is to give a safety margin of two millimeters. But if, it's, if you are confident about placing the plaque accurately, then you can reduce the safety margin. And I've developed templates where you transilluminate through perforations in the template, look for the so-called sunset sign, and you can be really confident about where the plaque is, and then you can reduce the safety margin safely. Plaque treatment is also very effective for, uh, for iris tumors, as we can see in this patient here. Proton beam radiotherapy, First, we define the tumor size and extent, and then we insert markers, prepare computerized models, and then they have a four or five day course of radiotherapy. So what has improved in previous years are defining the indications and contraindications for this therapy. My plaque results are so good because if I don't expect the results to be good, the patient gets proton beam. It's like choosing your examination questions in, a, in, a, in an exam. 
Adjunctive TTT can greatly reduce exudation. And one of the big problems with proton beam is damage to the upper eyelid, which causes keratinization of the superior tarsal conjunctiva, corneal ab abrasion, and lots of discomfort. And so we learned to treat with, through the closed eyelid, and that has removed all those problems. It's really good for iris tumors, just like plaque. It prevents the need for wide excisions. And, um, and then the stereotactic radiotherapy, um, which is with good indications, gives good results. Transcleral local resection, endoresection is a big, difficult operation. It, it's like a complicated game of chess. You need to know how to keep out of trouble. And to do that, you need to do lots of operations. And so it's not very widely performed anymore. Here's a patient who had a melanoma in his better seeing eye. It's a big tumor, basal diameter of 16, thickness of 13, going close to disc. I did a transcleral local resection, with adjunctive plaque radiotherapy, adjunctive laser treatment. And the patient many years later, 10 years later, still had 20-20 vision, even though he had only counting visions in the other eye. And so in, in, in uh, services with a large number of patients, it can give good results. Previously, I used to do cyclectomy, according to the textbooks, starting from the front and going anteroposteriorly with dilating the pupil, doing a broad iridectomy. But that causes a big iris coloboma, photophobia, cosmetic defect. And therefore, I learned to do the opposite of what I had studied, which is to constrict the pupil and do the operation back to front. And like that, it's possible to conserve the sphincter more easily and to get a better result. Endoresection in some patients is the only chance of preserving uh, vision if the tumor is big or close to optic nerve and so on. But recently, there have been cases of fatal air embolism with perfluorocarbon liquid, even when air infusion was not used. And that is resulting in the whole procedure being um, revised. Enucleation advances, well, personally, I moved to hydroxyapatite, and then I moved away from hydroxyapatite to acrylic, much less expensive, with equally good results, but others give good results with hydroxyapatite. Follow-up, really important. Wide-angle imaging has really made it easier to notice recurrence in many patients without ultrasound. And before we used to treat radiation retinopathy in one big basket with laser treatment, now we have learned to distinguish between collateral damage to optic nerve and fovea and lens, and we've learned to distinguish that from toxic tumor syndrome, where you get a radiation vasculopathy within the tumor causing exudation and relief of angio, release of angiogenic factors. So if it's mild, you can treat with anti-angiogenic therapy, or else you can give TTT to the tumor to reduce the exudation. Or if it's too extensive for that, you can remove the toxic tumor either by endoresection or by transcleral resection, as in this patient. This patient had a big tumor, treated with proton beam, got retinal detachment, neovascular glaucoma, pressure of 50. He had a CVA, a history of CVA, ischemic heart disease, arrhythmia was a warfarin, but it was his better seeing eye. So I did a transclear resection. The next day, the retina was flat. And over the next few months, the rubiosis, the neovascularization disappeared. We were able to stop the glaucoma drops and did very well. Next, we come to prognostication. The standard method in all cancers is the tumor node metastasis staging system. But this is based only on anatomic predictors. And the problem is it does not take account of, of histologic and genetic predictors. So the important histologic predictors are the melanoma cytomorphology. If you've got epithelioid cells, a much worse prognosis. And then you've got the, you've got the extravascular matrix patterns, the closed loops, and the mitotic count. And these are all correlated with increased mortality. 
Now, as long ago as 2007, I showed that, that the prognosis is worse if you've got chromosome three loss, especially if you also have uh, chromosome 8q gain in the tumor. And um, this is now widely accepted. In the States, um, gene expression profiling is very popular, really because you need a, such a tiny sample that you can't even see it when you look at it under the microscope in the operating theater. And uh, that is proving quite uh, popular and, and valuable, especially taking into account the PREM mutations. And then there's the BAP1 loss, which is associated with a high mortality. And it's possible to detect this with immunohistochemistry, which is really, really valuable. And, um, and at UCSF, we found that next generation sequencing is really good because it gives a lot of information on many, many genes. And that is becoming uh, more popular more widely. But it's really important to combine all the previous, all the known risk factors in a statistical fashion, taking account of different forms of bias, competing risks, missing data analysis, and so on. I know the Shields have developed the premium model, which is great, but in Liverpool, we developed LUMPO, the Liverpool Uveal Melanoma Prognosticator in line, online. And that provides really good estimates of the prognosis also taking account of the patient's life expectancy. With regards to screening for metastasis, um, we have been using MRI in highly selected patients with chromosome three loss. And this graph shows how effective this strategy has been at detecting patients with metastasis before symptoms develop. There are other methods, there are CT, PET scans, but they expose patients to radiation. And if you repeat those scans every six months for many years, then you expose the patient to lots of radiation. Ultrasound, with an experienced ultrasonographer, you can get good results. Uh, liver function tests only become abnormal in terminal disease, are not very helpful. And chest X-ray also is not very helpful in the first instance, although oncologists like to perform that. With regards to treatment for metastasis, um, systemic chemotherapy has not worked very well. Liver targeted therapy has been better, especially with partial hepatectomy and um, interhepatic chemotherapy with melphalan and the isolated liver perfusion has, has given good results. Uh, immunotherapy has tended to prove disappointing on the whole, with some exceptions, because Uveal melanomas are much less immunogenic than cutaneous melanomas because they've got a lower mutation rate. There have recently been some very encouraging results with tibantafusp, which is a sort of, it's not a molecule, it's a sort of nanoparticle that grabs the lymphocytes, grabs the melanoma cells, brings them together, so you get lysis of the melanoma cells. And those results are very encouraging indeed. So in conclusion, there have been great advances in recent years in imaging, biopsy, immunist chemistry, genetic studies, treatment, prognostication, screening, and treatment for metastasis. And we can expect even more progress to occur in the next few years. I'd like to thank my colleagues, um, and I'd like to thank you for your um, attention. Thank you very much. Dr. Bertil, very nice uh, update on UVL melanoma. Can I ask you one question? Is there any role for uh, cyber knife radiation? Sorry, is there any role for uh, cyber knife radiation in choroidal melanoma? <coughs> Don't have personal experience, but from what I've seen, with good tumors, you get good results. With okay. big tumors, then of course, you've got this toxic tumor syndrome, and so you've got to deal with that in some way, just as you would need to do with drug treatment and protein beam and so on. And with 
radiation dissimetry planning, you can tell it is going to be collateral damage to the optic nerve and so on. So um, I think that's very promising where proton beam is not available. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, could I ask Dr. D'Amato a question? You are one of our senior leaders in the field of ocular oncology. And how are we gonna win with uveal melanoma? Do we need to be giving a systemic therapy at the day we first meet these patients as well as our local treatment to the eye? How are we gonna win with uveal melanoma? Medium-sized melanoma, the cat's out of the bag in 20, 25% of cases, large melanoma up to 50% of cases. Just your thoughts. Yes, I agree with you 100%. We need to treat these tumors as early as possible. And we need to give systemic chemotherapy, a systemic therapy of some sort, because in many of these patients, it's a systemic disease. By the time the patient comes to us, it's already a systemic disease. And therefore, just as you have been advocating for several years, we need to treat early, not just the eye, but systemically. The problem with systemic treatment is that there's systemic side effects, and it's also very expensive. And therefore, that's why we need to try to get more information as to whether the tumor has metastasized yet or not, or whether it has metastatic potential or not. And that's why, as you've been doing, it's important to biopsy these tumors as often as and as early as possible so that we know whether they are lethal or non-lethal. And hopefully, um, we're also be going to be able to look at liquid biopsies to, to, to avoid the need for doing a biopsy on these very small tumors. I've been very fortunate to work with retinal surgeons who can biopsy really tiny tumors, but in many places that's beyond the abilities of the surgeons there. And so hopefully there'll be liquid biopsies more generalized before soon. So I have a question uh, related to the same discussion that we are having here to Dr. Carroll as well as Dr. D'Amato. So considering uh, a prophylactic chemotherapy in these patients, would it be, uh, would, would, uh, is it the genetic mutations uh, that you would consider in starting the chemotherapy or basically the clinical size of the tumor? That's a, that's a difficult question because Monosomy 3, and I've tended to focus on Monosomy 3, I come from that camp, the cytogenetics camp. Um, if you've got Monosomy 3, you're guaranteed to get metastatic disease if the tumor is big. With small tumors, we see patients with Monosomy 3 who are still alive and well after many years. But we don't know whether that's because of lead time bias. So we don't know whether in a few years time they will go on to develop metastatic disease, or whether we have actually prevented metastatic disease in some patients with small tumors with monosomy 3. But we don't know if there's a window of opportunity after the develop of monosomy 3 and before the metastasis commences. I'd be interested to know what Carol says. Yeah, so we just, <clears throat> um, we just published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology a series of a thousand cases that we had sampled for genetics. And uh, 50, 65% have disomy three and disomy eight, or maybe a little mutation in eight. So those are the patients we would consider maybe more low risk. So 30, 35% are high risk. They have monosomy three plus minus eight Q mutation. It's that group, Dr. Farouz, that I think deserves systemic therapy. And we've talked to Immunocore, and I know that Dr. Uh, D'Amato is working with them. We think Immunocore is the only immune therapy that really works for uveal melanoma. We think, and we don't know how many cycles, but we think these patients should receive some exposure to Immunocore to see if maybe we can reduce metastatic disease in our high-risk patients who are genetically tested. I think we need to start with really good science uh, as our basis for who we select
for systemic therapy and then say, okay, in our highest risk patients, if you give them six cycles of immunocore, this is their outcome. I, I really think that we are moving that direction. Immunocore already knows that we've talked to them about this. Yeah, and so the well. size of the tumor at the presentation doesn't have any uh, relevance, Dr. Carroll. So Martine Jager did a beautiful analysis where she looked at uh, AJCC plus cytogenetics, and she found they both play a role. So mm -hmm. I do think tumor size does play a role, but the, I, the most profound role is cytogenetics. Okay. So I think if we start with that, that's this kind of like the simplest, cleanest way we can select high risk and then uh, treat them. Okay. Immunocore is not without, you know, side effects. And some of the side effects are really rough, but it is the, the one therapy that we've had the most experience. And Bertil skipped over a beautiful slide in his presentation where he looked at, it was just a small cohort of patients who had immunocore as therapy for systemic metastasis compared to 900 patients who had all other types of therapies. And at two years follow-up, those that had all other therapies, only like 20% were alive, whereas those with immunocore, it was like 60, 70% were alive at two years. So there is a little bit brightness on the horizon with this one medication that is very specific for uveal melanoma. So that's very good news. It is. And I just hope the drug company will be able, will allow us to trial this medication. Right. All the best. <laughs> Uh, is there any other questions or uh, can we move to the next talk? May I ask one question? When you said the uh, fluid biopsy, would you actually mean vitreous cytology? No, I was referring to a blood sample. Okay. With other tumors like retinoblastoma, um, liquid biopsies are showing great promise. And so hopefully we can do that with uveal melanoma sooner rather than later. Dr. Marian, can you introduce yeah. the next speaker? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Usha Kim. Uh, she is the Chief of Orbit Oculoplasty and Ocular Oncology uh, at Aravindai Hospital, Madurai. And she is the president of Ocular Plastic Association of India. Uh, and she is also a director of Allied Ophthalmic Personal Training Program since 2005 at Aravindai Hospital, uh, Madurai. And she started a good program, the Ring of Hope Initiative in 2004 to raise funds for the treatment for, of eye cancers. Until date, she has treated more than 3,000 patients, has been benefited under this program. And we are very happy to have Dr. Usha over here and she is going to speak about uh, congenital ptosis. Over to Dr. Usha, ma'am, please. Is it visible? Uh. No touch. Not yet, ma'am. Just came Not and went off. Sorry? Uh, it came and then went off. Yeah. So should I just stop and start again? Madam, are you in the last slide in the presentation? I mean, no, you are I'm in the first slide. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Share. Yes. Yeah. But do you see the full screen? No, ma'am. Please no. make it full screen. Yeah. I'm trying to put it on. Uh, oh, madam, that is what I'm telling. I think uh, in the full screen mode, you are in the last slide of the presentation. So maybe you can uh, just open the first slide again and then share. This is the one. It says... Uh, with, without sharing, can you make it full screen and see whether it's the first slide or the last slide without sharing? 
So this is the first slide. I'm on uh, it. Can you, did you make it full screen? Uh, I Just yes. try to make it full screen. Visible now? No, no, now you're not shared. Okay, so I'm going to. Uh, this is the first slide, which is in full screen. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, absolutely not. No problem, ma'am. All right, so I'm going to. Share it. Yeah, now share. Come to the presentation. Sorry. So this is the one. You stopped sharing now. Yeah, now you have shared. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Is it full screen and it's not in the presentation mode yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to do this. Oh. Yeah, uh, very yeah. good. It no, it's come. fine. Yes. All those glitches for such an unfortunate soul. I have to... I, should I say I'm very fortunate to share a platform with the two uh, legends or should I say I'm very unfortunate to follow them after their wonderful talks. I think it's an extreme honor for me to be following such great eminent speakers. But uh, what I really would like to uh, bring to your attention is I'm going to be shifting gears completely and going to take you through uh, to something very, very uh, simple, but yet very challenging because it's not life-threatening, but it's vision-threatening. First, let me thank uh, the Cochin uh, Ophthalmic Association and Dr. Santosh and all those who have put together this program because it's such a treat. It's like having a feast all in one go. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Now, looking at congenital ptosis, why has it been... Uh, actually sandwiched in such an intensive course where it's all about life. Well, this congenital ptosis could be a cause for a loss of vision. So it actually results from a developmental dystrophy of the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. Now, you could have just a simple uncomplicated ptosis, which is easy to manage, or you could have a ptosis with superior rectus weakness, blepharophimosis syndrome, part of a big syndrome, Synkinetic ptosis, which could manifest as a Marcus Gunn syndrome, or it could be as a result of a misdirected third now. Now, in cases of simple ptosis, as you can see here, this is a simple ptosis, and you can see an other eye, other eye lid, upper lid retraction. You can see bilateral situations, but yet they are all simple ptosis of varying degrees. You could see mild, moderate to severe. All of these types of ptosis are a visual threat to the child. So it's very, very important for us to manage these children very effectively. Now, on the other hand, we have another challenge where there is an elevation deficiency, which may not allow us to correct the ptosis completely. It could be a part of the syndrome where you have, this is the blepharophimosis syndrome, which could be autosomal dominant. You have a vertical and horizontal fish, uh, fissure narrowing along with epicanthus inverses, telecanthus, and all of these put together, managing it is going to be very difficult. Marcus Gunn phenomenon is yet another challenge. Where you see a ptosis, and then when the patient opens the jaw or moves the jaw from side to side, there is a flutter of the upper eyelid. And again, a challenge because it's going to be a cosmetic blemish for these patients. Congenital third nerve is not very common, but yet we so we do see cases of these uh, third nerve palsies. So in a case of a congenital simple ptosis, what is the option that we have? The congenital simple ptosis with a very poor levator action, the one and the only option is a frontalis sling procedure. And uh, there are N number of modifications. I think everyone who's come across a case of a congenital ptosis has a different way of managing these. So we have double triangles, you have rhomboids, you have pentagons, you have uh, double uh, rhomboids, all of these that have been tried. But what I would like to emphasize is it all depends on the individual choice and the perfection in that particular type of surgery. So there has been a vast improvement and uh, evolution of the materials that have been used from fascia lata, which still stands as the best and the gold standard. Preserved fascia lata has been used. Non-absorbable suture materials have been tried. Mesh has been tried. But 
There is also a material silicon sling, which has been tried over the years. And now, when do we do this frontalis sling procedure is, is done when the levator action is less than four millimeters. There is a little uh, controversy about four and five, but I, I would prefer that we do a frontalis sling when it's less than four millimeters. But that is when the levator action is less than four millimeters. But it's contraindicated when the bells is poor and when there is a reduced corneal sensitivity and poor tear production. So now we can just look at the procedure, the different steps where you have markings made above the brow. And this is the simplest procedure. And uh, what we need to do is once the incisions, it's in the form of pentagon is made, you're passing a silicon sling material through each of these incision sites and uh, you're bringing out the sling. So this is a simple needle which can be bent to your convenience and passing through each of these incision sites, bringing it out through each of these incision sites and getting it into the summit of this pentagon. This is the Fox pentagon method that we follow. We had been using facial lighter earlier and uh, suture materials, but now we've started using the silicone material, which is very simple. Now you can simply pass it through the sleeve and titrate the height of the lid based on the requirement. You cannot compare it, so you place it on the uh, up, upper limbus and then bury the sleeve conveniently into the tunnel that's been made and apply a frost suture here to close the lid to remove the subsequent day. And the results are remarkable. This is unilateral ptosis, post pre and post correction, and bilateral ptosis, pre and post correction. And a modification that we have made is, we have made it even more simpler. In this particular case, you can see a left eye ptosis. We just have to make a two millimeter incision right on the forehead, and you can do a trans conjunctival approach where you will have to double flip the lid, double eversion of the lid, and you can pass the suture material, that is the silicon material, sorry, the silicon material behind the tarsal plate, which means it's right under the levator. That's where your plane is at the moment. And bring it out through the site of incision, which is hardly about two millimeters. And that's all that we need to do to correct the ptosis. And by this, you are actually correcting the you are clearing the visual axis and preventing the amblyopia that's occurring in these young individuals. And just one suture for our peace of mind. And that's all we need to do in this patients. And this is what you see pre and post operative picture. So this is yet another challenging situation where, where you have to correct the telecanthus, the epicanthus inverses, the vertical and the horizontal. Uh, narrowing. So what we do is you do a lateral canthoplasty, a, Z, a, a V viplasty, and then you can do a transnasal wiring and correct the doses by doing a frontalis sling procedure. And this is the post-operative picture that we see. As far as the Marcus Gunn phenomenon goes, I will show you a simple example. Here, here is a patient with doses and an opening sheet. It is cleared, but after correction, you get the clearance of the uh, doses as well without any flutter of the upper lid. Let's look at what the procedure is here. You need to uh, make an incision on the skin and identify the levator aponeurosis and excise the levator aponeurosis as much as possible, as far behind as possible, so that there is no chance of the levator reattaching. This levator excision is done only to prevent the flutter of the eyelid. So once you've done this, you'll create a dosis for which you need to do a frontalis sling procedure, which I'd shown earlier, uh, just the way we do it in the uh, simple uh, dosis correction. So the similar procedure is being done in this case as well. So this can be done under local anesthesia in adults and under general anesthesia in children. Often it is done only at the time when the patient becomes very conscious about the flutter. So it's not very often that they come as children. 
And the other good side to this is these patients do not often go in for amblyopia because they know how to keep their jaw in position in order to open the eye. So that doesn't result in amblyopia. And that's probably one reason why they don't come in early. So that's the frost suture that's being applied and we close the eyelid. Now let's look at what's happened to this young man who has a flutter on opening and closing the eyelid. And right after the surgery, this is what has happened. The patient's ptosis has been corrected and the flutter has stopped. So this is the uh, result of excision of the levator and frontalis sling procedure. Now fascinella servet is another procedure where there is very minimal ptosis there you do a just a tarso conjunctival dissection. <clears throat> and the results are promising in very minimal doses as well as when the levator action is good. Now, in cases of uh, a third nerve palsy, you need to do a squint correction first to correct the diplopia. And then you can subsequently allow the nerve to regenerate. Probably six months to a year later, you can perform a frontalis sling procedure. And it's always preferable to do an under correction. A horizontal squint, you can do it alongside of the frontalis sling, but a vertical squint has to be corrected first before you advocate a frontalis sling procedure. Now, let's look at what we do in this case. In this particular case of the third nerve palsy, we have done a levator resection where we've identified the levator upper neurosis and this is being done under general anesthesia. So measurements have ought to be done prior to surgery. And the amount of resection has to be based on the algorithm which we have. Often a millimeter ptosis would require three millimeters of resection. And once we identify the upper neurosis, we have to dissect it anteriorly and posteriorly. Posteriorly, you have the conjunctiva. So you, with caution, because right behind the conjunctiva is the cornea. So with Great degree of caution, you have to identify the upper neurosis anteriorly and posteriorly. Anteriorly, you have the fat, as you can see, and posteriorly is the conjunctiva. Once the adequate amount of uh, levator is uh, dissected, you need to reattach it to the anterior portion of the tarsal plate using absorbable sutures, especially Vicryl 60 suture. One suture in the middle corresponding to the visual axis and one on either side of the suture in the middle, medial and lateral. And all along you maintain the contour of the upper lid and ensure that the visual axis is clear. And the excess amount of uh, levator is excised. Now a word of caution here, do not stretch the levator too much because you can have a false outcome. Yes. And once the excision is over, you need to suture it inclusive of the cut end of the levator along with orbicularis and skin to give us a good lip crease. And that would be the outcome of the ptosis correction on the table. Now, if all of these procedures fail, what do we do? We do have some temporary options, which are the lid props, uh, which can be used in cases of severe ptosis where there is muscle weakness, especially with CPUO and when there is a very poor pels and those patients who are surgically unfit, we can try and use these lip props. But the one word of caution, it is not a very comfortable, uh, uh, you know, the gadget to be using it on children. But you can try it in adults. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Again, I, I place on record the efforts put in by the Cochin Ophthalmic Society, Santosh, Aryan and the rest of the team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Usha, for a wonderful talk. Uh, are there any comments by anybody else? Ganga, Dr. Grover. Uh, Dr. Santosh, uh, no, uh, Dr. Usha, uh, is uh, uh, four millimeter, uh, more than four millimeters, uh, can you do a levator section? Four to seven millimeters, or would you prefer sling? You said? Yeah, so that's a very, very tricky question. Uh, tricky question. You have nailed me here, actually. I think it's a very, very difficult and challenging situation because this four to six is a very tricky uh, functional unit. 
most of the times we try to uh, do a levator, maximal levator resection or you can do an internal sling. But when I, uh, when I go in favor of a sling, I would prefer an external sling because it's far more easier. But between four and six, you can always try a maximal levator resection. That's it. Yeah, yeah, you can counsel the patient and tell him you may have to do it again and then you can repeat. And, and when, uh, do you need, do you feel that uh, long term the sling has slipped and should you fix it to the tassel plate? Yeah, so it, I think uh, I started way back very early using the silicone material, and I somehow I've had very good success with these cases. Not to say that I've never had slipping of these slings, but I've never had to suture it to the tassel plate because the very fact that you suture can cut through. That's number one. This is in my hands. I must uh, accept that. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize is there is a, some form of inflammation caused by this material, which itself acts as a band and uh, does not allow the slippage. Yeah, but in cases which has slipped, uh, I have seen that it's uh, slipped uh, yeah. up so, to even up to the witness. So yeah. I don't know. And you have a slippage. The easiest thing for us to do is you can remove it and redo it or because the incision sites are very, 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 very minimally sized one. Or if you can reattach it, you could probably do it. But I feel it's best to redo it if the effect doesn't sustain. But most often, since the inflammation is there, there is a band associated which helps actually in sustaining the effect of the skin. So may I comment on these two aspects? Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. And on the question of uh, the choice of surgery in somebody with elevator action of four and five, I have increasingly shifted away from levator surgery and increasingly prefer the sling surgery. But even when I get a good attachment to the uh, vitnal ligament and can do a vitnal sling, the initial results are usually very good intraoperative results are very good but the long term results tend to be they, they need there is often a regression of process which um, then requires another procedure and we need to take undertake a sling but um, and that is why i would not usually now do a levator procedure with the levator action of 6 less than 6 5 or 4 i would not do here, here, I just want to comment one thing, sir. When I was, I think I'm maturing now. And I think you've reached the state of highest maturity. No old is bold and no bold is old. So I think we've all uh, evolved out after having burnt our hands. And I, I do agree with you. Now, I think I tend to uh, drift more and more towards the sleep. Even up to seven seven millimeters of levator action, you you cannot be sure it will yeah. be sustained. Yeah. Relatively more sure. I mean, with levator, you are never sure. But yes, relatively more sure with uh, levator action six or above. Yes, I would happily do a levator surgery, even though it will be close to a vitnals for a six, vitnals sling for a six millimeter dosis. As for fixation of uh, the sling on the tarsal plate, I never really enjoyed it. Whenever I tried that, I don't get as good a contour as I would when my sling is supported just by the issue planes of the um, attachment of the um, orbicularis with the tarsal plate. And that is the reason why I don't enjoy fixating the sling on the, ta on the tarsal. I can't control the contour so well. Secondly, I sometimes get I margin malpositions also uh, if I try and fixate the sling on the tarsus. So, and uh, if you have enough tissue to support the sling, the slippages are very uncommon. So, I think uh, for that reason, I prefer not to fixate my slings on the tarsus. And uh, do you prefer to use one sling, one whole sling for one eye, or do you make it into half and Use the half because it's not very costly. It's now oro sling. We use oro sling. 
from I still, Arvind. So I still see no reason to waste and uh, use it for two. Yeah, but it's more comfortable using one for one night. That's what I found. Yeah, you, you have to go from top to the tassel plate. No, from the eyebrow. You become comfortable with whatever you are doing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I I think I'll speak for myself. I use one per thing, but then as uh, Sir was mentioning, it's totally up to the surgeon to uh, decide. And there is a there is always a generation gap. We they are uh, the seniors always tend to preserve whatever is possible and conserve and use the uh, make the maximum out of whatever is available. Whereas we try to maximize our comfort levels. And I'm in that category of maximizing comfort level, so I use one sling per case. Oh, one, one case. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, is it uh, another? Do you have time for questions, Gopal? Uh, I think let us move on. Uh, okay. Usha Madam also has to join another webinar now. Let us move on. So I'll be introducing uh, Dr. Fairuz, uh, who is uh, livened the oculoplasty scene in Kerala since the last few years. She is the founder director of uh, uh, Horus Specialty Eye Care Center, uh, which is a one-stop uh, uh, specialty eye care center in Bangalore. And we are uh, glad that she has she's so near, and we can refer patients to her actually. And uh, she has uh, uh, finished a fellowship with Dr. Carol Shields in Wilsai Hospital, Philadelphia. And she is, uh, she is known for her work in retinoblastoma. And uh, she is a multi-talented person. And she has won various Academy Awards at such a young age, uh, <laughs> including the American Academy of Ophthalmology Achievement Award and Asia Specific Academy of Ophthalmology Award. And, uh, and she's always there to help us uh, in, I always call her for help. Uh, I earlier used to call Dr. Santosh, but he is now too busy. Uh, so in my oncology cases. Okay, now over to Dr. Fairuz. Thank you, Dr. Ani, for this uh, kind introduction and kind words. Uh, I'm going to share my slide here. Hi, uh, fond greetings to everyone, uh, respected mentors, uh, professors, uh, teachers, colleagues, and my dear friends. I am extremely thankful to Cochin Ophthalmology Club who comes up with very innovative uh, webinars and uh, sessions. And uh, thank you for this kind invitation. For me, this webinar is so very precious because uh, this is a great opportunity and a platform given to me to be able to share with the most eminent leaders in ocular oncology and oculoplasty in the world. I'm extremely honored and it's a very, very proud moment. And uh, most importantly, I'm extremely grateful to my mentors, uh, Dr. Carol and Dr. Santosh, uh, because I'm going to talk about retinoblastoma here. And these are the two people who have held my hand uh, right from my baby steps in the field of ocular oncology. And both of them are right here. And most importantly, it is so very important and a proud moment for me because I am presenting and uh, you know having both of my mentors in the platform in my home state, that is Kerala and uh, Cochin, almost half my uh, hometown. So I'm extremely, extremely happy for this opportunity, uh, COC, Dr. Gopal and Dr. Shash, uh, Sai for having me here and uh, well I'm also grateful to my team the retinoblastoma team who have been uh, out through there in my journey of retinoblastoma so today I'll take you through what is new in retinoblastoma so uh, since the time that you know we discovered that there was a tumor uh, 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 retinoblastoma which came uh, and got published way back in 15th century there has been tremendous changes and the recent changes in the management of retinoblastoma even the basic classification of retinoblastoma has been very rapid and we are seeing many more changes with great researchers like dr carol dr abramson dr brinda galli dr santosh dr munya there are 
are so many leaders in this particular field who have taken this as a focus and been working for that. So we started with Dr. James Wardrobe and also to Dr. Carl Kupfer. Then systemic chemotherapy was introduced uh, in retinoblastoma. And from there, it was not looking back we have treaded forward in the field of retinoblastoma. So one thing which has never changed uh, from then to now is that retinoblastoma is a clinical diagnosis. Although we have been using the basic tools, which has been very precious, like ultrasound B scan to diagnose retinoblastoma, there have been uh, you know, progress as far as diagnostics are concerned. We have started using OCT, uh, and uh, fundus fluorescein angiography with various indications, but these basic equipment still remain the armamentorium of a retinoblastoma specialist. So it's always been a clinical diagnosis. Now, uh, since I understand, as Dr. Gopal has initially said, that uh, there will be a lot of postgraduate students who will be attending this uh, program, I'm going to go from the basics, how it is you know, uh, progress to the current management. So going on to the classification of retinoblastoma, what we have now is the international classification of retinoblastoma, which of course, Dr. Carol Shields played a major role, uh, a role uh, when it came uh, in, when it was introduced in 1996. So I'm going to kind of connect the international classification of intraocular retinoblastoma with the current TNMH classification so that it's very easy for you know the students to understand. So we started with the international classification of retinoblastoma with A, B, C, D, and E. A, it's very easy to remember. These are small tumors with less than three millimeter basal diameter, A, uh, uh, which stands for small, and then we have B, which are bigger tumors, more than three millimeters in diameter, and it has fluid, which has a bubble, B for bubble around it. So this is group A and group B. Now I'm going to introduce the clinical TNNH classification. So in the T1, actually, you can include the group A and the group B. So where the T one has one criteria which is considered, that is the size. So T1A is anything which is less than three millimeters and 1B is anything more than three millimeters. So this is where the group A and group B, which comes in the T1 clinical uh, classification of TNMH. Then we come to the group C where we have seeds. It could be subretinal seeds. It could be vitreous seeds. And if it is focal and confined, it is C, all right? And then we go to the group D disease where it's diffuse seeds, whether it's subretinal seeds or vitreous seeds. So now we come to the CTNMH T2 where we include the group C and the group D. So you have fluid here. For T2, you have two criteria. One is presence of fluid and the other is presence of seeds. And seeds are C2B. But of course, as a clinician and a retinoblastoma specialist, I think probably there need to be a slight modification in this because we have seen the outcome of retinoblastoma is different from focal seeds versus the diffuse seeding. You know, diffuse seeding has a much, uh, uh, you know, uh, was a prognosis when compared to focal seeding, but both of them has been included in the CT2. So group C and group D comes under CT2. Now group E are those which has extensive intraocular tumors where most of these eyes goes for enucleation with the clinical risk factors of systemic micrometastasis like neovascular glaucoma, massive intraocular hemorrhage, aseptic orbital cellulitis, anterior seedings, and even thysis and prethysical eyes. So the T3, group E falls in the T3 where there is advanced intraocular tumors. And in fact, the T3 has something called A to E. A is the thysis, prethysis, B is the tumor invasion, which is kind of local. T3 are those with neo neovascularization, neovascular glaucoma leading to bophthalmos. D will be high femur, massive vitreous hemorrhage. And once the patient reaches to a condition of orbital cellulitis and why does that happen? It is an aseptic inflammatory orbital cellulitis because of the large tumor occupying the intraocular space, undergoing necrosis, causing inflammation and causing orbital cellulitis. And then we have the T4, which is the extraocular tumor invasion. It could be those with, with radiological evidence, which is very subtle. And then if it is T4B, where there is extraocular tumor extension, which is clinically very, very visible. 
So then comes to the regional, you know, in T and M H. So N and M, N is the nodes, and then comes the metastasis. So you can have M1 without microscopic confirmation and M2 uh, with microscopic confirmation. So it doesn't stop there. This is for the students to understand if at all, you know, you are asked question regarding the recent classification of retinoblastoma. It also includes the pathological classification. Basically T1 are those where it's only confined intraocular without any local invasion. Local invasion can be choroid, local invasion can be anterior segment involvement. It can be sclera, it can be the optic nerve all right so pt2 is where the local invasion is uh, the invasion is very very focal it could be a focal choroidal invasion or a very focal uh, invasion into the iris the trabecular meshwork or the schlem's canal when we talk about t3 it's slightly more advanced when you know similarly in the case of the uh, clinical tnm classification where there is significant local invasion it could be a choroidal invasion it could be an optic nerve invasion and it could be a scleral invasion but sclera where the full thickness is not involved is the outer part of the sclera involved when the full thickness of the sclera is involved again when the optic nerve is involved where the orbital component of the optic nerve or the transection of the optic nerve in, is involved well, then it becomes the orbital or the extraocular retinoblastoma, and that is the pathological T4. So, what is more unique about the TN? M classification of retinoblastoma is the inclusion of H. We all know that retinoblastoma has a genetic predisposition. So this is the only cancer which has got the unique uh, ID of having hereditary or the H included in the TNN H uh, TNM classification. Then comes the classification of vitreous seeds because recently we have uh, found a lot of uh, research and publication which has come out with vitreous seeds because we have started treating it locally. And so this is the basic classification that we follow, like spherules, depending upon the morphological appearance of the tumor, dusting, if it is dusting the entire vitreous, and if you get chunks of clouds of vitreous seeds, it's called the clouds. Uh, the last uh, and the most important uh, uh, staging system uh, uh, classification is a staging system of retinoblastoma. It is basically the prognosis of life. So you stage the entire body. So it is from stage one to stage four, including you know enucleation where there is complete resection of the tumor with microscopic residual. It could be a regional extension with pre or you know a regional lymph node or the overt orbital disease. And stage four is something which is a metastatic disease. So this is what uh, you know the basic classification system of retinoblastoma is and this was basically targeted for the postgraduate student who's uh, students who are attending the session today now going on to the current treatment modalities of retinoblastoma i'm going to take you through this case how you know things have changed and how uh, the outcomes have become better in the recent past so this is a child you can see he has a bophthalmos the left eye is bophthalmic uh, which would anyway go for enucleation. And then he has a large tumor in the right eye, a bi bilateral retinoblastoma, sporadic. Uh, so this is his good eye, and that is the right eye. So you can see the entire uh, retina is uh, uh, filled with the uh, tumor. So you have lots of vitreous uh, seeds here. There is ferrule. There is lots of vitreous dusting over here and a large tumor, which is sitting right on top of the optic nerve. So whenever a doctor sees a case of retinoblastoma where the tumor is touching the optic nerve or standing over the optic nerve, it's kind of a panicky situation. But this is the only seeing eye of the child where you cannot take a decision of enucleating this eye because anyway, you would have to enucleate the other eye. So well, uh, Systemic chemotherapy and the introduction of systemic chemotherapy to retinoblastoma has been a great breakthrough and it has been extremely effective and developing countries like India and many other uh, uh, countries. This has been definitely a very, uh, you know, uh, affordable boon of uh, primary therapy in retinoblastoma. So the same child, this is pre-treatment, this is after three cycles, and this is what you see after chemotherapy six cycles, the systemic intravenous chemotherapy with the addition of intravitreal topotican. So the addition 
function of intravitreal topotecan in this particular eye, which is the only eye and the only seeing eye of this child, we could salvage the vision. So this is where we have advanced and progressed in retinoblastoma similar. So that was a bilateral case where, we are, where you are very desperate to save one of the eye. And if you ask me, well, if you receive a unilateral retinoblastoma where a condition is similarly you know, severe, would you want to save the eye? Yes, of course, I would definitely try to save the eye if it is not affecting the life of the patient. Similarly, a six-year-old child who presented with this uh, large tumor where there is absolutely no vision of uh, uh, the intraocular structures, and she has a ciliary body tumor, very inferior sitting, which is, uh, you know, spitting a lot of vitreous seeds and filling the vitreous. So this is after cycles of chemotherapy, still the ciliary body tumor is persisting over here, and this is how she looks after complete treatment. Do you want to know what the treatment was? Well, it was a sequential step of treatment in this child. Systemic chemotherapy, six cycles. Periocular topotecan, when you're really not able to go inside an eye, which is filled with vitreous seeds. So you go periocular, kind of try to get control of the vitreous seeds as much as possible. And then when you're able to go inside, you do an addition intravitreal uh, chemotherapy. And then finally, the ciliary body tumor was treated with plaque brachytherapy. And you can see here how well the tumor is regressed. And this child has a six by nine vision in this eye, where the vision was salvaged as well as the eye was salvaged. So in 2021, what we have learned and what we practice is definitely the goal has not changed. The primary goal of retinoblastoma management remains saving life, but well, we have progressed forward in saving eyes and saving vision to a certain extent with the recent advancement in treatment. So we all know that primary management of retinoblastoma comprises of two major things and intra-arterial chemotherapy has been a great contribution and more about intra-arterial chemotherapy. I learned when I was with Dr. Carol at Will's Eye Hospital because that was the time when she was doing extremely, uh, you know, uh, she was uh, researching a lot on intra-arterial chemotherapy uh, regarding its uh, outcome, regarding its side effects. And I was very, very fortunate to be there at the right time, at the right place to learn a lot from her. And I'm so grateful. So we all know that uh, systemic chemotherapy and intra-arterial chemotherapy, though there are many pros and cons. But in a country like India, we, we find systemic chemotherapy very cost effective. It is easily available and effective. And of course, it achieves all three goals. And why is that important? Because we are in an unfortunate situation where patients comes with a very, very advanced disease, where there is still a chance, a high risk of systemic micrometastasis. And intra-arterial chemotherapy, of course, has great, uh, uh, you know, if it's extremely effective in certain uh, 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 tumors, especially the group DIs, which we are going to uh, see later. But the only, uh, uh, I would say, the con of uh, intra-arterial chemotherapy in India and developing countries is basically, it turns out to be expensive for these patients. So there are adjuvant modalities in retinoblastoma where you use focal therapies like cryotherapy, laser therapy, periocular chemotherapy, intraocular chemotherapy, which is the latest addition, and plaque brachytherapy. Systemic intravenous chemotherapy, universally, uh, the protocol that we follow is the Vincrist Vincristine itoposide carboplatin protocol. There has not been much change in that. And uh, with systemic intravenous chemotherapy, of course, we have found good results with group A, group B, and group C eyes. But group D eyes are the dicey situation where sometimes most of these cases might land up with a nucleation. But with the addition of intraocular chemotherapy, we have been able to save these eyes. So going on to intra-arterial chemotherapy, there are only two goals that we achieve with this eye salvage and vision salvage. It has nothing to do with life salvage because there is no systemic concentration which is achieved, which can kill micrometastasis with retinoblastoma. So it is basically targeted into the eye and so are the indications which has to be carefully followed. So uh, we, uh, so the catheter is directly introduced via the femoral artery into the ophthalmic artery. As you can see here, it speaks into the ophthalmic artery and once it is uh, fluoroscopically confirm that the catheter is in place, the chemotherapeutic agents are injected. Now, the advantage is the drugs that we use in intra-arterial chemotherapy is def 
totally different from the systemic chemotherapy. So this is melphalan, topotecan, and carboplatin. So even in a, it can be used as a secondary chemotherapy where uh, the chemo resistant tumors with vincristine, etoposide, and carboplatin can undergo secondary intra arterial chemotherapy, even if not primary chemotherapy. And these drugs can be used as a triple drug, a double drug, or even a single drug therapy. So uh, my team uh, who does intra-arterial uh, chemotherapy is basically an interventional neuroradiologist. Uh, so my uh, responsibility in this particular team job is uh, to group the tumor, uh, to correctly assess whether it is safe uh, for this child, uh, you know, without any risk for systemic metastasis, uh, uh, for the indication to go for intra-arterial chemotherapy, decide the dose, and then collaborate and communicate with them so that appropriate management is done. And so, uh, fortunately, have an excellent team. So these are the results of intra-arterial chemotherapy, a large tumor, a group D tumor with diffuse seeds. And this is how it looks like after three sessions of intra-arterial chemotherapy, where the entire tumor is calcified. A very peripheral tumor, located tumor, infro uh, uh, temporal tumor, where you can see there's a large tumor occupying. And this is after the complete reduction, uh, you know, after three sessions of intra arterial chemotherapy. And this is the corresponding OCT picture where the posterior fundus is absolutely healthy. And if the correct doses are used uh, with caution, of course, we will have some amount of, uh, you know, good amount of vision salvage as well. A group P eyes as you can see here, after four sessions of intra-arterial chemotherapy, still there is persistent seeds, as you can see here in a bag over there. After addition of intravitreal chemotherapy, the complete tumor. So is it safe? Well, in a good hands, uh, it has a learning curve. And this is what I have learned from Dr. Carol. Even she has published the initial cases. Well, there were complications. But as the learning curve improves, you know, the complication rate has been negligibly very, very low. So it's very good in good hands. And the youngest case that I have in my series is a four weeks of age child. And the oldest in my series is 15 years. And Dr. Carol has published a 23 year old who has undergone intra arterial chemotherapy. So this is a table where, you know, chemo reduction, systemic intravenous chemotherapy and IAC is being compared. So well, in ABC, well, there is not much of difference. But when you take group D eyes, which is uh, is slightly difficult uh, in salvaging eyes with systemic chemotherapy. There is a absolute jump from 47% to 85 to 94% as far as eye salvage is concerned. We did, uh, along with Dr. Carol, we did a review of, uh, you know, the intra-arterial chemotherapy uh, uh, in uh, uh, IJO recently. So we found that, well, of course, uh, the promising outcome with group D eyes, but group E eyes, although, uh, you know, in certain eyes we use, it has not been too encouraging and promising. Uh, now, uh, this is something that I, uh, you know, recently Dr. Carol has published in again in IGO where, you know, we all know that in older children, it is very, very difficult to salvage the eyes uh, with systemic chemotherapy because they'll be coming with a lot of vitreous disease and it's very uh, difficult. So they have found that intra arterial chemotherapy in older children, you know, uh, in 13 eyes, uh, in 13 older patients, they found that I IAC demonstrated reduced need for EB or enucleation. And they compared it to the pre-chemotherapy era and the intravenous chemotherapy era. And it's a wonderful article. I think all of you should go and read it. Now, we all know that the newer the advances, uh, you know, uh, there are certain uh, because eye is a very sensitive organ. We're talking about choroid, the RPE, and the retina. So there can be certain complications. Well, the most common side effects of IAC that we usually come across is the hyperemia because of the vessels, which is uh, you know being uh, catheterized and the chemotherapeutic agent spreading over the uh, vessels. They also come with ptosis. These are all uh, you know self-resolving uh, side effects. But well, the vision-threatening side effects sometimes worries us 
And this is exactly, you know, when you have to choose the eyes which has to undergo and be very, very careful when vision is very important in these children. Well, uh, you know, alopecia is a known complication of systemic chemotherapy, but I have had a series of children who even uh, has been, uh, you know, had uh, alopecia after intra-arterial chemotherapy. So this is such a case where an intra-arterial chemotherapy was done for a peripheral tumor, you know, a very good visual potential eye, but unfortunately the child developed uh, severe choroidal atrophy and RP atrophy with no visual potential in that eye. So uh, choosing eyes for intra-arterial chemotherapy, we have to be extremely cautious. Group E retinoblastoma is kind of a gray zone. And what you really need to know is what are the cases that you should not be doing, the contraindication, especially those with advanced intraocular retinoblastoma where you have suspected clinical high-risk features. And bilateral intra-arterial chemotherapy, yes, we have groups who do intra-arterial chemotherapy in bilateral cases, but when you are in a situation where you have to salvage at least one eye for vision in that child to live a quality of life, you should be you know, kind of hesitant in using bilateral IAC in these children. The very, uh, you know, as we all uh, already discussed, now eyes in retinoblastoma with vitreous seeds has been quite challenging right from 1996 to 2012. This is a review that we have seen, systemic chemotherapy have been used. And in between, periocular topotecan was introduced, then methotrexate, then came melphalan, and well, this is what we published with the periocular carboplatin. And well, there has been a slight increase in the salvage of the eyes, but then in introduction of intravitreal chemotherapy which we all shied away long, long back. And also, again, I was in the right time at the right place with Dr. Carol when intravitreal chemotherapy was just introduced, like in 2000. Uh, 11 and 12, and a lot of work was going on that. So I was very fortunate to again learn the technique with her and you know what is the best drug to be used. So this is what uh, uh, the technique that we use, I learned it from her. So 32 gauge needle, pass planner approach, uh, you know, uh, the dosage used depends upon what kind of drugs you're using, melphalan, stick on to 20 microgram. If it's topotecan, you can go even up to 30 microgram. So this is a child, as you can see here, prosthetic eye in the right eye, a 13-year-old who presented with recurrence after many, many years, uh, you know, after he completed his chemotherapy and even receiving EBRT in the left eye when he was three-year-old at 13 years of age, he presented with uh, vitreous seeds. Then the only treatment that I gave was intravitreal topotecan four sessions. And this was a recurrent tumor, which of course received uh, transpupillary thermotherapy. Now the indication of uh, intravitreal uh, chemotherapy has extended slightly beyond vitreous seeds. I do use it for subretinal seeds as as in this case where you can see the complete resolution of the tumor. Even in endophytic small recurrences, also, uh, you know, I would prefer intravitreal topotecan, and this is after three sessions of intravitreal topotecan with good results. Uh, this is uh, uh, Raksha Rao and Dr. Hunawa who has worked on it uh, with 17 cases, and this is, uh, you know, the series of cases which has been, uh, which I have, and it has been extremely encouraging. Now, this is something that I have, uh, you know, uh, 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 come across recently. I'm sorry, I, um, well, yeah. So this is called the precision intravitreal vitreal chemotherapy. My animation is not working here. So Dr. Carol will be able to talk more about this. So precision intravitreal chemotherapy is again an innovation introduced by Dr. Carol. So where they go very close looking into with an indirect ophthalmoscope going very close to the area of the vitreous seed and injecting directly upon it. I'll take a question with her on this particular paper. And this is a very innovative technique. Now comes the intracameral injection. We have started going into the anterior chamber trying to salvage those eyes with anterior segment invasion. And this is a clear corneal approach with 20 mic 10 to 20 microgram. And I don't use melphalan at all in my practice. I use topotecan. And mel uh, definitely an intracameral, intravitreal, only in few indicated cases. So this is a case where the child has bilateral uh, uh, older child with bilateral retinoblastoma, both eyes presenting with anterior segment invasion. Other eye has already gone for thysis when he has uh, uh, been referred with systemic chemotherapy and the only eye was this. And all his seeds were sitting at the ciliary body, ciliary processes where we had to go inside the anterior segment intracameral injection. And luckily so far, uh, you know, the 
we uh, had not found any uh, recurrences. He, in fact, had got plaque brachytherapy also along with it for a few of the ciliary body chunks that he had. Now, going on to enucleation, well, we all know uh, that uh, there are certain things that you have to keep in mind regarding minimum manipulation techniques, long optic nerve stump, and most importantly, looking for the pathological high risk fact, uh, factors. So from the past to now, you know, this is what the survival of enucleation in retinoblastoma was way back in 18th century. And even in 19th century, the early 19th century, it was the survival was only 57% despite enucleation. So what is the important thing that helped us in life salvage after enucleation is identifying the pathological risk factors and giving adjuvant chemotherapy to these children to prevent systemic micrometastasis. And most importantly, post-enucleation rehabilitation and cosmos is very, very important. So these are the children who were born in the 90s, who underwent enucleation, who underwent radiation, but things have changed now. So it has become more easier for us to convince the parents for enucleation. And this is a child who is easily and happily sitting on the lap of an ocularist for a customized ocular prosthesis. So customized ocular prosthesis can be done even in a small child, he's just one year of age. And this is what we have advanced. So in such scenario with a good uh, cosmetic rehabilitation, it has, you know, I would think that it is also an uh, advanced. Orbital retinoblastoma, we have seen the intensive multimodal treatment protocol with high dose chemotherapy, enucleation, uh, in addition with external beam radiotherapy that we were able to even salvage the eye. Post chemotherapy three with the thysis, this is the time that we we would enucleate with a large optic nerve stump, and this is after post-enucleation radiotherapy. So in our study, we have found that recently with this uh, introduction, which Dr. Hunava has, you know, uh, introduced in uh, India, where we, we in fact uh, come across orbital retinoblastoma with advanced tumor, that it has been 90% with the multimodal treatment. Now, this case uh, came uh, with a microphthalmia in the left eye and a bophthalmos in the other eye. So this is how she looks like where we had planned enucleation of the left eye and regression. So she had coloboma of the optic disc despite being the only seeing eye. But well, you know, after the uh, when the child was advised in nucleation, uh, they, they were just lost to follow for one and a half years. And this is how she came with an orbital extension of the left eye. And of course, you know, recurrence of the other eye. So even now in 2021, we have challenges of social beliefs where the child has gone for an alternative medicine for chemotherapy. So we need to do a lot of awareness even at this period and also imply and uh, you know make it clear that it's a curable eye cancer. Metastatic retinoblastoma, well, the prognosis is very, very poor. You have to actually uh, evaluate the regional lymph nodes depending upon where it is affected, the bone marrow or the central nervous system. And this is how uh, you know uh, we take this treatment forward. So the prognosis is better if it is regional lymph nodes and bone marrow, but well, it's prognosis uh, bad in central nervous system. Trilateral retinoblastoma, not much has come forward. In fact, there are papers who have published uh, you know, survival in metastatic retinoblastoma, but uh, still uh, the prognosis is grim. Now, genetics plays a major, major role in retinoblastoma. That itself is a big topic. I'm not going to touch on it. This is a father who was is bilaterally blind, enucleated, radiated. He had no idea that the child is there is a possibility of this child, his uh, offspring, having a retinoblastoma, and the child developed retinoblastoma with an advanced tumor in the left eye. So genetic testing in retinoblastoma uh, should be considered mandatory in most of the patients uh, for further research. So this is the present where, you know, advanced tumor, we could salvage the eye. In orbital retinoblastoma, we are able to salvage the life as well. I'm stop. I mean, I'm concluding my uh, talk, but as a proud parent, I'm one of the very proud uh, treating doctor of these children who also <laughs> requires... Uh, social rehabilitation. This is a child who has undergone enucleation, but she still is very expressive and she is one of the finest dancer, even as a young child. So even a social rehabilitation of these children is very, very important. And I would just highlight the fact that retinoblastoma is a curable eye cancer if detected early. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any comments, Dr. Shields? <clears throat> I'd like to thank Dr. Farouz for such an encompassing overview of retinoblastoma. <clears throat> and I like the way that you kind of blend in 
the international classification of retinoblastoma with the uh, AJCC uh, TNM classification that really makes it useful. Thank um, you, Dr. I, I must throw the compliment back to you and Santosh because in the US we have learned so much from you regarding number one, the benefit of topotecan. We now use topotecan in many patients as a first line intravitreal injection. And number two, we've learned how to treat orbital retinoblastoma from you. So there's, there's a lot that goes back and forth between education. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Thank you. Dr. Karen, would you want to speak uh, a little about the precision intravitreal chemotherapy? Sure. Yeah. Yes, so in that one case that you showed where there was a temporal macular lesion that had a little bit of vitreous seeding over that, that's where we would use precision injection. Basically, if you see focal recurrent vitreous seeds, instead of just randomly injecting into, into the eye, we will go in and using the indirect ophthalmoscope, we will place the needle about two to three millimeters from the seeds and then inject our chemo right over the seeds, watching the chemo go over the seeds and we position the head so the chemotherapy just sits right there in the seeds to protect the macula. That's, that's really important with melphalan, not as important with topotecan because melphalan is so much more toxic to the retina. Yeah, so the practicality of it, I think I have to visit you to see that and learn it actually. So mm -hmm. uh, who, like, is it the same person who does the indirect ophthalmoscopy also injects it? Yes, so okay. we put the needle in, ophthalmoscope is on the eye, lens in the hand, but I can't inject it. So I'm going and I'm directing it as if I'm gonna do a fine needle biopsy. I stay about three millimeters away make sure the bevel's pointed down to the seeds, and then my assistant will push it. Okay, okay, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, then. Uh, we move on to Ganga next. Gangadhar Sundar, can you, uh, Mariam, introduce him? Yeah. Uh, Praveena, can you just share your slide of Dr. Gangadhar? Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, Dr. Gangadhar. Uh, it's my great privilege to introduce Dr. Gangadhar Sundar. He's the head of orbit and ocular feature surgery and adjunct faculty in the National University Hospital, Singapore. He's the vice president of Singapore Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, as well as he's the chairman of the Scientific Committee of Asia Pacific Ophthalmic, Ophthalmic Trauma Society. He is uh, instrumental in starting multidisciplinary services in uh, NUH retinoblastoma service, NUH. Uh, thyroiditis service and NUH lacrimal service. More than that, he has authored a book on orbital fractures, principles, concepts, and management, and co-authored a book on ocular adnex lesions, a clinical, pathological, and radiology correlation. And uh, I have got a personal touch because I have received the first Gangada Sundar Award for the Young Ocular Plastic Surgeon in 2000, way back in 2012. Over to Dr. Gangada, please. Um, I'm not authorized to share my slides. You have to authorize me. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, no, no, no I think, yeah. Oh, now it's on. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thanks, uh, Marianne, for your kind introduction and truly an honor to be with the stalwarts. I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but I'll try to do my best. So Santosh has tasked me talking about, uh, to talk about orbitofacial fractures, the current practice. I bring you greetings from this part of the world, Singapore and the Asia Pacific Society, but uh, these are real stalwarts from whom, the teachers from whom we have all learned and continue to learn from, and they are truly an inspiration. And I also thank the organizers for the kind invitation. So these are 10 points I'm gonna talk about in the next 20 minutes at all. First of all, are all orbital fractures blowout fractures? Because that's what we taught in our residency and our fellowship curriculum. How do you image these orbital fractures? When should you be fixing them? What is the relevant applied anatomy, which is new, which is not there in the textbooks necessarily? What are the principles of management of fractures? How do you approach them? What are the principles of atraumatic reduction of orbital contents? What are the implants do I have and how do I choose them? Anything special about pediatric fractures? And finally, how do you ensure quality control? So these are my disclosures. First of all, we are taught that orbital fractures are synonymous with blowout fractures. And that's not true. If you look at uh, analysis of over 1,000 fractures that we have in our practice over the past 10 plus years, we blowout fractures only account for 30% of all the orbital fractures. In other words, 
the orbits are involved in a conglomeration of various other types of orbitofacial fractures. And hence, it's very important to realize that the 70% of fractures which are not pure blood fractures are also orbital fractures which has been managed by us oculoplastic surgeons. So based on this, we came up with a practical classification of orbitofacial fractures. We classify them into simple fractures, which can be linear and trapdoor fractures, blow out fractures, which can be one wall, two wall, very rarely three wall fractures, and a small component of blow-in fractures. Whereas the complex fractures with orbits are involved, including the ZMCs, the NOEs, orbitofacial fractures, which are the Lefort type two and type three, and finally the craniorbital and panfacial fractures. These are examples of pure blood fractures involving the floor and the middle wall. Whereas you can see here that it's not just the orbits which are involved, the skull base involved. So there's a cranio orbitofacial fracture, and this is a nice case of a NOE fracture, bilateral nasal orbital fracture, which has implications not just from the eye, but from the canthal deformities and the nasal lacrimal duct as well. As, hence, it's very important to classify orbital fractures into simple and complex. Why? Because the complex fractures you'll have to manage along with the cranio maxillofacial surgeon, but as a simple or pure orbital fracture is what we manage on our own. Blower fractures can be either of the single wall or two wall, and these have specific implications in terms of the incision, the approaches, the implants, and uh, the outcomes as well. Examples of complex fractures, the ZMC fracture that you can see on the right side, which can be of various types, and NOA fracture, and the tubes here kind of show that the nasal lacrimal duct system has to be preserved before you put all this hardware along the medial canthal area. And finally, craniorbital or panfacial fractures, which you have to have a concept of sequencing these repairs and no point just fixing the orbital fractures alone. The second question we're gonna talk about is, how do you image these orbital fractures? X-rays are history, MRI is probably coming in, but CT scan is a gold standard at this point of time. It is not just a CT of the orbits, but a CT of the face and the orbits. And we now embark on IGS protocols, image guidance surgery protocols, where the images are acquired in an axial format, but eventually formatted into coronal surgical and if necessary 3D reconstruction. So gone are the days of spewing films, and now it's all using the DICOM data to look at these various images in various formality. Because if you look at purely the axial images here, it looks like a medial wall blower fracture. But only when you see the coronal images, you realize it's not just a medial wall, but a floor fracture as well. And you look at the sagittal, you're able to identify the posterior ledge. Hence, you have to learn to look at the films at, uh, or the images in various formats. And examples, the same DICOM data can also be used for pre-operative treatment planning for navigation surgery. Hence, it's not films anymore, it's a DICOM data that we use. You do your pre-operative surgical planning, so which you can use for navigation surgery and eventually for post-operative treatment quality control as well. The third question I'm gonna to touch upon is, when should you be fixing these fractures? What are the timings and what are the indications? We came with the mnemonic of the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and a H on top of it as well, where based on the age, whether it's a unilateral or bilateral fracture, whether it's a complex or a simple pure orbital fracture, the degree of displacement, whether it's associated entrapment, remember it's not just the extraocular muscles, but we're looking at the intermuscular septum, very rarely the globe as well, with associated foreign bodies and globe injuries, because those have to be addressed before fractures are uh, repaired. And finally, high risk factors. This is what determines whether a patient is going to require a fracture repair and in terms of how soon you're going to do it and are you going to do it by yourself or along with the cranial maxillofacial surgeon. But the general take home message is any significant orbital deformity, especially the younger the patient with disability, with functional implications and in certain situations, aesthetic implications in enophthalmus. And the threshold for intervention kind of varies depending on your expertise. We had these oncologists talking to us about various forms of interventions. No casual ophthalmologist can go ahead, do all these intravitreal chemotherapies and intracameral chemotherapies without expertise. Likewise, the threshold for intervention varies based on experience and the technique and the technology you have, provided you have a realistic consent from our patients and their families. In terms of timing, Again, there's a stratification as well. You go in ASAP in all pediatric white eye trapdoor fractures, not necessarily blowout fractures. With ZMCs and NOEs, you go within the first week if you can, provided the patient is medically stable. The typical blowout and blown fractures, you go in in a couple of weeks. And of course, the residual deformities, you fix it as and when necessary. What is the fourth important thing you should learn about orbital fractures? What is really new about orbital fractures? And this is how. A patient presents with a clinical photograph, but this is how you mentally see these patients with the globe and the adnexus structures and the malpositioning of the globes itself. 
what the way we see orbital anatomy nowadays is we see it like a picture frame where there's a frame which is the orbital rims on the outside inside the rims uh, orbital cavity are the walls are the vital structures and we divide these orbital cavity into the anterior one third where we are usually comfortable dissecting middle one third which is where most of the fractures are and the posterior third is where you want to stay away from it keeping in mind the various anatomical landmarks including the concept of the anglo anglo intramedial orbital strut we'll talk about it today so traditional orbital anatomy was just this and we used to memorize the seven bones but one of the bones which is constantly forgotten by the residents in the examination is the palatine bone but we now think that the palatine bone is extremely important because it is against that posterior ledge that these implants are being placed so do not forget or neglect that small piece of bone right at the apex of the orbit against which these implants are supposed to sit otherwise you'll end up with complications another important concept of anatomy is that standard anatomy textbooks do not draw the floor of the orbit like an s curve they draw it as a straight line and that's why you see post operative enophthalmos when you put a plate implant along the floor of the medial wall you have to understand there's a posterior medial bulge bulge which gives you the anterior vaulting of the globe preventing post operative enophthalmos which has to be reconstructed here's an example of coronal scans where you show the concept of the inframedial strut which is a buttress in the inframedial orbit which if violated result in globe malpositions so in such complex fractures we measure what is called the angle of the inframedial orbital strut where you mirror it and prebend an implant if necessary or when you're using a patient specific implant and reconstruct the orbit place the implant against the posterior ledge so that you get anatomically correct reconstruction what about the principles of orbital reconstruction anatomical reconstruction like the retina surgeons talk about results usually in functionally good outcomes and most importantly in aesthetic and psychological outcomes what are the principles of management of fractures it's o r i f what we're talking about is open which is incision reduction reduction of orbital contents with internal fixation and there are situations where we see surgeons have not reduced the orbital contents just opened and internally fixated these fractures with bad complications so if you were to reconstruct a complex orbital fracture with the rim is involved with the frame of the orbit is involved no point reconstructing the internal orbital walls without reconstructing the frame so there is a particular sequence that you should follow roof followed by the lateral wall followed by the inferior rim and then the medial wall and then and only then you can go ahead reconstruct the interior orbital structures here's an example of a patient where there was no anatomical reconstruction you can see where the implant was placed in the maxillary sinus way below the posterior ledge with clinical consequences of enophthalmos and motility disorders where you have to do a revision of surgery itself so what are the ways you approach these fractures by default most orbital fractures are approached by transconjunctival incisions and this gives you good exposure to the floor to the medial wall and you can go all the way to the apex including the uh, posterior strut and you're able to identify the intraorbital neurovascular bundle and preserve it itself Here's an example of a patient we just did this on Friday a young 13 year old boy was punched in the face by a child a fellow student they do a simple simple inferior fornix incision followed by dissection where you're able to go directly to the periosteum and do a subperiosteal dissection and that atraumatic subperiosteal dissection gives you wide exposure and in this case we didn't even have to do a canthotomy and a cantholysis so we can actually reconstruct both the floor and the medial wall with a simple inferior swinging eyelid approach with a prebent implant or a patient specific implant without even resorting to a retrocurrencular or transcurrencular incision for a lot of these combined floor and medial wall fractures and of course if you have complex fractures involving the skull base involving the rest of the mid face of the orbit and the mandible or the extensive of the maxilla and the zygomatic buttresses you have to resort to other incisions The next thing I'm going to touch upon is what are the principles of atraumatic dissection. As a beginning surgeon, always start off with wide incisions, usually with a canthotomy and a cantholysis. But as you evolve towards surge expertise, you move towards minimally invasive incisions without a canthotomy and a cantholysis. We try to avoid an inferior oblique disinsertion whenever possible because that can cause you torsional diplopia. Avoid damage to the infraorbital neurovascular bundle. It's very important to have sensations of the forehead and the cheek in these fractures. identify the periosteum and try to do a pure subperiosteal dissection keeping the orbital fat under the malleable or your dedicated retractors avoid intracranial dissection manipulation that's what results usually in pupillary dilatation and ex excessive scarring postoperatively feel and see the posterior ledge and place these implants and of course don't 
ignore the concept of the pupil monitoring and ensure that you have a good negative forced action test at the end of the procedure. Finally, if you decide to reduce the contents, how are you gonna fix these fractures with implants? You have a whole choice of permanent and bioresorbable implants. In our practice, over the years, we know 60% of the fractures that we do, we use bioresorbable implants. These are an assortment of various permanent implants and various bioresorbable implants. This is an osteopore, which is made in Singapore, and a rapid sorb implant made by Johnson & Johnson, both of which have their role in vast majority of pure orbital fractures. And of course, what is really new in implants is a patient-specific implant where this implant, like an uh, implantable contact lens is custom designed for the patient for that particular defect. We tend to use it for revision fractures or complex fractures, but a simple version of a patient-specific implant is a pre-bent, uh, pre-fabricated anatomical plate constructing the floor and the median wall. And finally, uh, a quick word about pediatric orbital fractures. This picture is a child was punched in the face, assaulted. He doesn't even want to open his eye and notice a barf bag that he has, vomiting. So injury with vomiting, always think about a white-eyed trapdoor fractures. And you don't pick it up unless you start looking at motility of these patients, which is oftentimes impossible in uncooperative patients. X-rays can be negative. And here's a soft tissue window, a scan was done where initially there was thinking that there was no fracture, but only if you look at the bone window, you see this minor trap door along the floor in the median wall. So the principles of management here is a high suspicion in a white eye trap door fracture, perform an examination of anesthesia and orbital exploration, it has to be done on an urgent basis, release the trap contents, place bioresorbable implants in children whenever necessary. And exceptionally, there are situations where you don't need to place an implant your crack fracture. Examples of patients who have healed 18 months later with bioresorbable implants. This is a late post-op scan of a patient showing complete healing, hence driving home the message you don't need permanent implants. The final set of slides is about quality control and orbital fractures. In the past, we were sticking these implants, not knowing and really hoping that you've done a right job. And nowadays you have to have intraoperative visualization with the naked eye loops and a headlight. You can have endoscopic verification of placing these implants on posterior ledges. You can use intraoperative navigation, which is similar to GPS technology. What is really coming in a big way is intraoperative imaging, which can be done either with a comb beam CT scan, or as you can see in this case, an intraoperative CT scan. So you ensure right at the end of surgery, the implant is in the right position. So in summary, we touched about orbital fractures, how to image them, how to read these scans, how to classify them, knowing the applied anatomy, indications and thresholds for intervention, using the various implants and ensuring quality control. And I urge all youngsters to work in multidisciplinary teams, just as how we do in oncology. We work with pediatric oncologists, adult oncologists, interventional neuroradiologists, radiotherapists, so on and so forth. So you should probably work with CMF teams. So thank you very much for the kind invitation and very happy to be here with you all. I only wish I can share the wonderful dishes that Kerala has to offer with the flavor and aroma and the clean air. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very, be very beautiful uh, and a comprehensive review of orbital fractures. And of course, you have written a book on it. So with the authority of speak on it. Dr. Crover or anybody had any questions on this? Uh, Ganga, I would uh, only ask you about the change in your uh, spectrum of use of implants. You are increasingly using bioresorbable implants. Now, um, would you confine them to pure floor fractures or for fractures with medial wall fractures combined? Would you still think of bioresorbable implants or would you stick to titanium for them? It's interesting you asked this question. Dr. Mike Kazin is here, actually. My first ever poster on our results of bioresorbable implants was presented at his Orbital Society meeting. Dr. Kazim, I know you're, you're here. I, I am. At the Orbital meeting that you organized across Green uh, uh, Central Park at the New York Academy of Medical Sciences. Yes, that, that was a wonderful meeting. Thank you for remembering it. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm interested to hear your answer. Yeah. So we started dabbling with it in 2004 onwards. And initially we were using very soft bioresorbable implants. But lately, most of the bioresorbable implants are thermolabile and stiff implants, which can be pre-bent and maintain their shape. So we started using them for small fractures, then became a little bit more daring and started using for medium and large size floor fractures alone. 
Nowadays, we use it for floor and medial wall fractures because they maintain the shape and we're able to show that the bone heals around these defects. So in patients who are not likely to be injured again and again, that i.e. no Y chromosome in their body, not likely to be injured again, I tend to use biorosorbal implants. In occupational trauma, construction workers, motorcycle riders, guys who are always doing kickboxing all the time, I tend to use permanent implants. And what uh, what brand are you using? What is the uh... for the large defects? We are using the polylactides made by Johnson and Johnson. It's called Rapid Sorb. They also the thermal label implants. You can bend it to a particular angle, a contour if necessary. For the small to medium, we use the osteopore or osteomesh implants, which are relatively softer and supple, but they come in various thicknesses. Those are the ones we use. It was also interesting to see you speak about uh, maintaining the patency of lacrimal passages in the early management of NOE fractures. I would like to know more details because that's a very tough area. Um, how do you uh, precisely ensure in the primary management that you're maintaining the patency of those passages? Right. So we know that about 7 to 15 percent of mid facial fractures and typically involving unilateral or bilateral. NOE fractures have some form of NLD involvement. These are bony nasolacrimal duct involvement. We know going and doing a DCR, and Dr. Grover, you gave a beautiful talk earlier this evening. Dr. Grover was in a master class earlier this evening with the, the Bangladesh Ophthalmic Oculoplastic Society. Doing a DCR in a post-traumatic patient can be a nightmare with high failure rates, with abnormal bony anatomy, hyperostosis, failure rates, and so on and so forth. So in such patients, I look at the CT scan. That's why the CT of the facial skeleton is very important, not just the orbit. The fractures of the lacrimal sac fossa or the nasolacrimal duct, we do a prophylactic lacrimal intubation even before you start placing incisions and dissections and moving the bone fragments in that region. Leave the stent in place, do your complete mid-facial reconstruction, tie the knots, and are removed in six weeks. So with that, we have completely reduced the incidence of post-traumatic dacrocystitis in mid-facial trauma patients. Um, and you, you can share your experience, Dr. Grover and Dr. Kazan. I, I would only feel that uh, it, with a bony fracture involving the uh, nasolacrimal duct, you would have a tough time intubating. Um, mm -hmm. How does it go? I think we, we are kind of familiar, especially pro with probing in children, navigating in the interluminal space. Nowadays, we even have a lacrimal endoscope that can guide you if necessary intraluminally. But more often than not, just a pure soft tissue dissection, knowing the direction of the anatomy without using too much force. There are probably only two case scenarios where I could not intubate the system and I abandoned it and had to do a DCR in one patient. The other patient didn't have to do a DCR. And I use the standard Crawford tubes. That's a great idea. I think uh, that would help in improving the results a great I mean, preventing a dacrocystitis is much, much, much easier than managing a post-traumatic dacrocystitis. Dr. Kazan, what do you do? I, I totally agree. And, and I think over the time that I practice, it's become just as apparent as it is to you that you can avoid the necessity for a, a late DCR or post-traumatic DCR, as you pointed out. Um, if, you, <clears throat> if you anticipate it, you put those tubes, and sometimes it takes a little manipulation, but early in the, in the course of the surgery, if you can get those tubes in, you're way ahead of the game. Um, and the, on, the only struggle I've had is to try to educate the plastic surgeons and the ENT surgeons and the oral surgeons who are doing this work, because typically they don't, they don't give much uh, mind, uh, care to the nasolacrimal system, and then we see them late and you know, dealing with the, the problems that you mentioned. So no, I... I totally uh, agree with you. And I think that's a, a message that should get out. Yeah, I think that is an important thing because at the moment we don't mostly, most often we don't get involved in the management of uh, those fractures and the ENT surgeons and the plastic surgeons would do it without uh, uh, involving us. I think uh, Marion knows and I keep talking, preach, almost preaching yeah. Uh, plastic surgeons that you have to be available when the plastic surgeon or the cranial maxillofacial surgeon needs you. Yeah. You have to have a value add to show that you have a new skill that they don't have. Yeah. Uh, I have I'm aware of a single case where a plastic surgeon who was doing a mid facial fracture repair thought intubation is an easy process. 
placed the tube, forced it down, ended up in the middle cranial fossa. My God. Believe it or not. Uh, and that's when they start developing a respect for your simple intubation technique. <laughs> oh, boy. Any, any more questions? Okay. If not, thank you very much. Uh, actually, a thank special you. regards to Dr. Michael Kazin because historically I was supposed to have joined him as a fellow years ago. Uh, never happened, but I've continued to learn from him over the years. And uh, he amazes me with his knowledge and constant innovation and contributions. No. Gan, Gan, you eclipsed anything that I could have taught you. So congratulations. <laughs> I'm very, uh, I'm very proud to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Kalsim, a doyen in uh, orbit, uh, especially thyroid eye disease. He's a clinical professor of ophthalmology and surgery at the Harkness Eye Institute, Columbia University Medical Center. He's well recognized for his work in the field of orbital disease, especially orbital tumor and thyroid eye disease. Uh, he's a chief investigator for many, uh, several clinical studies for thyroid eye disease. And he's a member of International Orbit Society, American Society of Ophthalmic Plastic AAO, major surgeons, and is a founding and first president of the International Thyroid Eye Disease Society, where we, they have instituted ITDS criteria for follow up and first visit, especially in patients in managing patients with thyroid eye disease. Also, a recipient of many awards, including a uh, Lester John Surgical Achievement Award from ASOPRES. Over to uh, Dr. Kaysim, please. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind inter introduction. I'm going to share my screen in the hopes that it'll work. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you to uh, all of you, in particular, Santosh, for the invitation to speak today at their, with all the rest of our illustrious speakers. Is, is my first slide visible? Yes, yes. yes. Great, thank you. So <clears throat> I've been asked to speak about what I consider today in 2021, a logical approach to thyroid eye disease. And in order to derive that, I think we need to cover several items. First, we need to be uh, understanding of what a, a reliable diagnosis of this disease is. What's the natural history of the disease? How do we stratify the risk of developing bad disease? What are our treatment goals? And what, are, what therefore are treatment options in each of these cases? So to begin with, the diagnosis is established uh, with the presence of two out of the three of the following uh, features, the typical clinical features, the radiographic findings, and the appropriate serologies. The clinical features I'm speaking of <clears throat> are either unilateral or bilateral eyelid retraction, more so still if there is uh, temporal flare, bilateral proptosis, and restrictive strabismus. The second is the serology, and that involves <clears throat> the presence of an autoimmune dysthyroid state, either concurrently or in the prior history of the patient. If you don't have the presence of a, or the diagnosis of autoimmune dysthyroidism, one can go to antibody testing to include TSIs, TRABs, TBIIs, or TPOs, but they don't carry quite the same weight as the uh, full-blown diagnosis of autoimmune dysthyroidism. The radiographic findings are known to most of us. <clears throat> the presence of enlargement of the superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and far less commonly the lateral rectus in a fusiform pattern that spares the tendon. So if you want to make the diagnosis, you only need two out of three. And as a consequence, radiographic imaging is not required in all cases. What's the natural history of thyroid eye disease? Well, we're all very familiar with the terrible cases that seem to go on forever, but the truth is, and it's important to bear in mind that 100% of these cases are self-limited. In a non-smoker, that is limited to a year in most cases. And in, not, in smokers, unfortunately, it does continue for two to three years. Spontaneous resolution is common and not a unique event. Uh, and there are differences in the phenotypes based on the age of the patients, and I'll mention that a bit more uh, in the next slide. And I think this is what has been under considered in our, uh, in our discussions of thyroid eye disease. The age really makes a difference. So when you're looking at patients in their 20s, 
30s, they tend to be very uninflamed. They tend to have lid retraction or at the very most proptosis due to fat expansion. When you're in your 40s, certainly 50s and 60s, congestion, proptosis, lid retraction, motility imp impairment, that becomes a much bigger uh, feature. And the patients that worry me the most are these seemingly quiet patients who show up in their 70s or 80s uh, with double vision. And they are uh, key, um, the key element is to look for compressive optic neuropathy. They'll have it very, very frequently. Again, roughly three different stages uh, age. The majority of these cases are mild. You have lid retractions like so, and sometimes patients actually think they have ptosis and their, their, their lid retraction is inapparent to them. And these more severe cases, why, again, you have to be able to distinguish those patients that will become uh, bad and those who won't. The disease progresses variably. Certainly, we've all seen these patients that go from slide left to slide right in less than a month. But I'll also show you some cases where patients seem to have had relatively significant disease and without any treatment whatsoever, they seem to get better over time. Again, no treatment, no surgery, no medical treatment. So it's important to bear in mind those cases. So what's the risk stratification I spoke about? Well, the low risk patients, again, are young patients. They're certainly less than 40. They are female and they progress clinically in a slow fashion. The high risk patients, the ones that you really wanna think about treating uh, medically in the acute phase, those are patients who are older than 40, the worst of them are older than 70. They're typically male, they're smokers. In two recent studies that we've published, we've identified sleep apnea, the presence of actually even just the, the high risk nature of sleep apnea uh, as an as a indicator of high risk severe disease. Diabetics, patients with dermopathy, uh, pretibial myxedema and acropaxy, rapidly progressive disease, and the early development of motility impairment. All these are high risk patients. What are the treatment goals? Well, here's where I, I, I vary from some other folks. And I think that overall, the studies that have been conducted <clears throat> on the uh, treatment of thyroid eye disease focus on disease modulation. That is suppression of the disease. So you reduce casts, you reduce inflammation, you reduce pain, reduced hearing, so that's disease modulation. But in my view, the more important factor is being able to modify the disease, to modify the durability of the disease. So you want to be able to suspend the active phase if you can, if you need to, by a medical means, because that's how you, that's how you decrease the need for disease modulation. So again, disease modulation is suppressing symptoms and signs, disease modification is shortening the disease. Other measures of, of uh, therapeutic efficacy are the reversal of the clinical features and the reduction in the need for surgery, another underappreciated um, important outcome measure. So what am I talking about? Here's the Rundle's curve. Things get worse, then they get better, and then they stabilize. And again, about a year, a year uh, or so in a non-smoker. If you modify the disease, you're simply suppressing the severity of that or the height of that Rundle's curve, but you're not changing the length of that curve. And if you are in fact uh, modifying the disease, you are pushing it to the left. So the disease term is, is shorter and the consequential uh, um, un, unmodifiable disease features, they are not gonna to accumulate to the same degree. We have any number of different metrics. The popular ones these days are, are CAS. Um, but each of the measures of clinical disease are important. Diplopia, proptosis, lid retraction. Uh, the CAS, for, for those who are unfamiliar, um, is a multi-point score to include the measures of uh, what was initially intended as a measure of uh, responsiveness to steroids. So a patient uh, came to the clinic um, in Amsterdam and they wanted to know would these patients respond to steroids. High CAS scores mean ability to respond to steroids. That, however, has been transferred into a sense of activity, which again, in the highly congested, highly inflamed patients will in fact be um, uh, good measures of activity. But in the, the milder uh, cases here in the lower left, 
this young woman has a CAS of one, but she is 30 years old, she has lid retraction, and she has uh, proptosis from fat expansion, so she doesn't have a high CAS score, but she is still active. Uh, similarly, this older gentleman I showed you earlier has a terribly active and severe disease, but does not have a high CAS score. <clears throat> You can then measure proptosis with her tells, lid retraction, and a motility, uh, extraocular motility is measured by any number of different ways that are both subjective and objective. The current fashion is to use the Gorman score, which measures activity subjectively, uh, either uh, absent, intermittent, with gaze, or constant. Uh, and it has its limitations, um, which we can discuss if you're interested. What are our therapeutic targets? Well, the scientists have provided us with a much greater understanding of the um, mechanism, the pathophysiology of thyroid eye disease. And uh, this lecture doesn't give me uh, time to discuss this in detail, but just suffice to say that corticosteroids, which have been our mainstay, suppresses all of these systems. Whereas uh, things like rituxan uh, affect the B cells, uh, tocilizumab at the IL-6 target, TNF-alphas go through PGE-2, NSAIDs, um, simple NSAIDs, NSAIDs can uh, positively affect the COX-2 mechanism, and radiotherapy has an effect both on the presenting cells, the macrophages, and the um, orbital fibroblasts, changing them from a, a pluripotential cell to a, uh, an, a more um, basic uh, uh, fibroblasts. And then the most recent uh, addition is teprotulumab, which is an IGF-1 receptor blocker. So what are our options? Well, uh, published have been studies on selenium, prednisone by mouth or IV methylprednisolone, radiotherapy, rituxan, tocilizumab, tepro. And uh, I conducted a meta-analysis of, uh, of the studies that exist. And there were well over 100 studies. And I was looking for uh, prospective trials, randomized trials, blinded trials, single entity treatments, patients who were treated before they had nine months of active disease. Again, because as you get closer to that one year, the disease uh, natural history takes over and the largest cohorts. I put on a chart here uh, the studies that I will discuss with you. I will tell you that these all follow, uh, fit the criteria. There's PO steroids, IV methylprednisolone, teprotulumab, rituxan, and selenium. I've included tocilizumab despite the fact that it does not meet those criteria simply because it is of recent interest to everyone. And I'll just show you where it seems to fit. But just as a disclaimer, uh, these patients were treated after a year of thyroid eye disease and had been pre-treated uh, and failed steroid treatment. So it's not entirely the equal of the others, even in terms of its evaluation. So in terms of CAS reduction, most of these uh, interventions seem about the same. Uh, PO steroids, minus two, IV methylprednisolone, minus three, reduction in CAS, same two for Tepro, um, and rituxan. Selenium, not quite so much. In proptosis reduction, the, the current uh, fashion is to have a, a drug that can reduce um, proptosis by about three millimeters. Uh, and on average, Tepro meets that criteria. IV methylprednisolone is only two millimeters um, and rituxan pretty much the same. So more or less the same in terms of proptosis reduction. Motility improvement uh, has been shown um, by Gorman score uh, to improve by in 70% of patients who are treated with IV methylprednisolone and in 68% of those treated with Tepro, the rest of the drugs don't seem to help. Um, lid retraction, that's where selenium shines. It's been used on the milder cases and uh, nearly half those patients seem to improve as was the same result with tocilizumab. Reactivation, okay, now this is that disease modification as opposed to modulation. What we've been talking about so far has been disease modulation. But in terms of disease modification, uh, the only, whoops, the only drug that, yep, here we go. The only drug that uh, reduces uh, the long-term effects of the disease 
is rituximab. They had no reactivations after their trial. When you use steroids alone, you have a 30 to 40% chance of reactivation. And as well with the, um, the new um, IGF-1 drug, Tepro, 30 to 50% of patients will have a reactivation and same too for tocilizumab. I should add that if you use radiotherapy, orbital radiotherapy, 2000 centigrade, in addition to PO steroids and IV methylprednisolone, or IV methylprednisolone, our study, um, when we use this combination to treat the most severe patients with optic neuropathy showed a reactivation rate of less than 5%. So disease modifying manipulations are limited to radiotherapy and rituxan. All the rest are disease modulators. Uh, rehabilitative surgery occurred in about 30% of all uh, cases, irrespective of the treatment. And the TEPRO group saw no difference um, in the outcomes uh, of the patients needing surgery if they were treated versus placebo. Safety is something we need to look at very seriously. We're all very familiar with the side effects of uh, steroids, both PO and, and IV. Um, uh, rituxan, while it is a very seemingly effective drug, has a one in 10,000 uh, incidence, unfortunately, of uh, death by PML. Tocilizumab, not so uh, many uh, side effects. But the, um, the one issue with the new Tepro drug is this hearing loss, which is as yet not terribly well characterized, but we're accumulating anecdotal evidence of patients who have had irreversible hearing loss. So it's something to, to bear in mind and, and, and consider when enrolling patients. The costs are hugely different. Uh, steroids are relatively inexpensive, whether you're giving them by mouth or by, by intravenous route. These are all U.S. dollar and U.S. costs. Rituxan is also in that same $5,000 range. Tocilizumab bumps it up by tenfold to 64000 And Tepro, unfortunately, is astronomically priced at roughly 400000 U.S. dollars for a course of treatment. And that's certainly worth considering. So what are our treatment options in the active phase? Well, to begin with, if we're looking at the low-risk patients, these young patients I mentioned, slowly progression, lid retraction, and maybe some mild proptosis. <clears throat> the disease modulation that you can use and I use is um, diclofenac, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. They get either 50 or 75 milligrams twice daily, depending on their weight. Cold compresses, lubrication, elevation of their head, the usual. Uh, the disease modification is a stern insistence that they stop smoking, perhaps uh, being on CPAP if they are at risk. Lowering their TSH is helpful, and selenium seems to have some benefit on their immune system in general. For the medium risk patients, those are patients that have rapidly progressive disease, early diplopia, and congestion. The disease modulation is steroids and or rather disease modulation of steroids plus some form of modification in my hands that is typically radiotherapy. Uh, rituxan if uh, radiotherapy is contraindicated and if you have the means to uh, employ Tepro that is an equally effective treatment on this um, medium risk uh, group. But again, one has to be concerned about the 40%, 45% reactivation rate at the end, and that may also require some disease modification as well. In the high-risk group, uh, these are the ones uh, who have compressive optic neuropathy. For me, they undergo a PO steroid trial for a period of two weeks. If there is a significant improvement in their optic neuropathy, they get a 12-week course of steroids, be it oral or intravenous, Plus, they need some modification. Again, typically radiotherapy, uh, in fewer cases, rituxan. If the steroid trial fails after those two weeks, then they undergo orbital decompression. And if their disease is closer to the beginning, shorter number of months, not anticipated to go into remission in the relatively near future, those patients will also, after their decompression, undergo radiotherapy so that the disease will be modified and you won't have a rebound as you sometimes do after decompression surgery. Stable phase options are typically surgical uh, involving a graded decompression, strabismus surgery and lid retraction where needed. And again, beyond the, the scope of this, of this lecture. 
So overall, to successfully treat thyroid eye disease, I think the approach in my hands is to first make a reliable diagnosis, understand the natural history of the disease in general, and stratify your patients based on the risk that they are going to develop uh, severe disease and irreversible consequences of the disease. Figure out what your, certain, what your treatment goals are going to be. What is it that you want to treat in the individual patient and pick the treatment options that are most appropriate to them in the hopes that you can suspend their disease as quickly as possible, limit the number of irreversible events that they have, and limit as a consequence the number of surgical events that they'll have to undergo. Thank you again to all of you and for the opportunity to speak uh, to you this, uh, this evening. Thank you so much. It was a excellent coverage of the entire thyroid IDC spectrum. Uh, Ganga, do you have any comments? You are, I, I know that you are interested in thyroid IDC yourself. Yeah, I'd like to hear. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, of course, and I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. I, I know you do have, uh, I, I shouldn't say a bias, but a lot of experience with radiotherapy. And uh, people always see radiotherapy in isolation, but you drove home the point is always radiotherapy with corticosteroids and probably no difference between oral versus IV corticosteroids. Could you share with us, have your thoughts changed or experience changed in the first say 10 years versus the second 10 years of application of radiotherapy and thyroid eye disease? You know, that's a great, that's a great question. I think that the, that in the beginning of my practice, I had two different kinds of patients that went to radiotherapy. Um, the compressive optic neuropathy patients that were, that were steroid responders, and that has persisted through the, through the years. The second group of patients that I had early on were patients who had come to me uh, steroid dependent. So whatever their symptoms were, they, they, they seemed to be unable to withdraw from steroids. And it was a paper we published many years ago where we saw that, that that group of patients responded well to radiotherapy and presumably for the same reason that you're suspending their active phase. What has probably occurred in the last decade, and this is a look at that, at that middle group of patients, the moderately severe group, the ones that have early uh, diplopian and encouraged by some of the work that, that came from uh, Peter Dolman and his, and his uh, group in Vancouver, that you can get the benefit of the steroids that was shown in, in the group uh, in Amsterdam uh, in terms of congestion and pain and, and maybe even improving some diplopia, but you make it persistent. Again, the problem I have with steroids and for that matter, any other drug that simply uh, suppresses disease is that it's not a persistent effect. And if you're de delivering that treatment early in the course of their active phase, you can pretty much anticipate that they're going to have a rebound. It's a completely different event if you're going to give them that intervention at month nine, as opposed to month three. So <clears throat> based on, on that, I will take those early active, uh, severely um, uh, rapidly progressive patients and treat them with steroids and give them radiotherapy to, to modify the disease. And frankly, if, if rituxan was a more routinely safe drug, right? If you didn't have to deal with that one in 10,000 fatality, I think I would choose that one uh, much more regularly because it, it really does uh, demonstrate um, in, the, in the studies that have come out of Milan, very nice response in both the, the uh, active phase and the persistence or lack of persistence of disease. Um, but that's the problem with that one. Can I ask a politically a political question, but at the scientific angle before Dr. Grover takes over, the Yugogo philosophy versus the ITITS philosophy, you know, there are different principles, concepts, and applications intervention. And this is for the benefit of the thousands of delegates who are logging in. I'm going to be viewing it down the road. Which way do you veer and pros and cons of each? Sorry, well, I'm not sure exactly what, what difference it you're referring to. I, if you could tell me, that, it'd be a big help. But, you know, there, there, are, there are differences that exist in terms of medical therapy and surgical therapy. What, what in particular did you... Did you right. So, you so, so I, I'm I, I'm a member of Ugo Go in the sense that we are the only non-European center member of Ugo Go, and the latest guidelines now talk about use of mycophenolate along with intravenous steroids, 
Ugoco has always been a big believer of intravenous steroids. I know North America generally it has been oral steroids rather than intravenous steroids, partly because the way practice works. Some people believe it makes a big difference. Some people don't believe it makes a big difference. And also the introduction of uh, the newer modalities of treatment. So we have a first line, we have a second line. They are skeptical about methotrexate. They're skeptical about uh, ASA, uh, but they use, some of them use cyclosporin which is not often talked about. So I was just wondering, because I know well, you're an ITES person. No, I, I, think, I think what you point out is actually something very interesting. And that is that due to the relatively small number of patients in this disease, right? It is very hard to, to generate good studies. And I think Ugogo has done a wonderful job at generating good clinical trials. And I think the, the TEPRO trial is also an example of what is the evolution of, of these trials uh, for the better. They're all for the better. That being said, some of the other drugs that, you're ref that, that you reference, unfortunately, have kind of fallen by the wayside because they were never subject to the scrutiny of a very well-controlled trial. And, and that's what worries me about some of these other new drugs that are coming online. If you don't study them accurately, then the results will never be able to support their use. So that's what happened with colchicine. That's what happened with, with methotrexate. That's what happened with any of these other drugs that, that you know, azathioprine, I guess, is to some degree studied well. But I, you know, I, if, if you want to speak specifically about oral steroids and IV steroids, I think the big difference is that anytime that I put someone on steroids, and I don't care whether they get them intravenously or orally, they're going to get radiotherapy. Because I don't, I don't, I don't really view the steroids as, as the be-all and end-all. Uh, so if they're bad enough to get steroids, they're getting radiotherapy. And I think that changes something quite, quite fundamentally about the outcomes. That being said, I think, I think Hugo was absolutely right that the side effects, the perceived side effects for patients on IV steroids are much less than they are on oral steroids. Some patients can manage them well, but they don't, that they're, they're uncomfortable on the, on the oral drug. So I think that's a major improvement. Um, and I think the, 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 the only reluctance that may exist in the U.S. is that finding centers that will do the infusions is difficult. And that's, a, that's an economic question, which you know, we can discuss over, over a drink sometime. But that's, I, don't think that, I don't think that speaks to the, to the, to the important question that you mentioned. Sure. But I think that's, that's, a, that's a big difference. Thank you. Well, again, thank you, everybody. Uh, Dr. Kazim, um, it's been a wonderfully educational talk. I think the division uh, into modulation and disease modification that you presented uh, in terms of meta-analysis also as modifying and modulating, I think that is quite, quite significant. And, and that adds a lot to our perspective and understanding. Uh, you also spoke about the large uh, number of deactivations that are present with uh, the proteumum map, which many of us initially thought would be the wonder drug. Supposing the cost of uh, teproteumumab was not a factor, where would you place it in terms of importance? And uh, rituximab, you just mentioned, um, has an advantage in terms of reactivation. Um, but if you were to put it in perspective, considering the advantage offers and the kind of low mortality that it affords, where would you place them in the uh, spectrum of thera our therapeutic armamentary? Right. Well, let's start, with, let's start with let's start with the method. Let's start with the rituxan first, because we all see patients who have other autoimmune diseases that that are on rituxan, and in the one that we deal with most most commonly, right? Uh, all these all these uh, invasive inflammatory diseases and methotrexate for sure has been an enormous benefit uh, to those autoimmune, you know, it was not developed for autoimmune disease, but for patients who have been on chronic um, steroids, it has completely game changed, you know, whether they're on cyclosporin and, 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 and steroids, this has been a game changer. So again, if not for that, for that um, risk factor, one in 10,000, that would probably be my number one drug. I would use it just like the rheumatologists use it for rheumatoid arthritis and the like, and I would stop the disease. That would be my treatment. Um, so if I had a choice and I got rid of that one in 10,000, that would be my choice. You know, the, the advantages and the disadvantages of the uh, Tepro 
it's, it's basically a steroid type drug, right? So again, it's like a modifier and it's a very effective modifier and maybe has a little bit of, of an advantage in terms of the outcome measures, right? But if in fact the study results from their trials are in fact true that you have a 40, 45% chance of relapse, well, then it looks just like steroids. And, and, and the anticipated uh, response from the company is, well, you just treat them again. Well, that's, that's fine. If the, like you said, if the drug is cheap and that's not, a con and that's not an issue, then I think it looks very much like steroids. The one thing though, and again, the, the patients that I have enrolled have all gotten hearing testing at the beginning before they get treated and I treat and I retest them the three um, cycles in to see if there is a trend towards hearing loss. And if there is, then I just stop the drug. Uh, and we have not yet had enough time with this drug. I mean, this is not like tobramycin where we understand the serum levels are subject to the, you know, the risk of hearing. And we know what those numbers are, you know, all that, that toxicity. We don't know that, we don't know that. You know, with this drug, you know, it could be like rituxan, where every every time they look, you can get a you can you can get efficacy with a lower dose. So we may have that with this drug too, if we lowered the the uh, the um, drug dose by tenfold. Well, maybe the, the toxicity goes away. So if you get rid of that problem, then I get sort of a whole lot more comfortable using it uh, as a replacement for steroids. But you're still going to need to do something with as a disease uh, uh, modifier, unless of course the, the drug is completely safe and you can use it for a course of a year or a year and a half. You know, I mean, if, you have, if you have a magic bullet where you can say, I can give you a suppressor, it won't make you toxic for a year and a half. Well, then that's fine too, but we're not quite there with that drug yet. Not quite there. One last word that I would like to hear from you is uh, your, uh, the percentage of your patients who receive radiotherapy and uh, where exactly do you choose to give your radiotherapy? I mean, physically where? This particular Physi case. Yeah. So the, uh, I would say that probably 20, 25% of my patients get radiotherapy, something on that order. And, and the majority of them have always been the compressive patients. And I've expanded into the severe. In fact, one of those patients I showed you was a, a urologist and Within a month or so, he was he had terrible chemosis and and uh, motility impairment. And I just saw him three months in, and he's off his steroids, and he's back. To, you know, he, he's fine, right? So I, I would say it's about 20 to 25 percent in terms of where I deliver it. That's the one thing that I insist that I I refer those patients to the radiotherapist at Columbia, because I as, and if that's what you're getting at. Um, I don't think that it's something one can hand off to the inexperienced uh, radiotherapist. If you're doing this once a year, you probably shouldn't be doing this. I think you need a place where it's an active center. So, you know, I'm sending one or two patients a year or something like that, I don't know, a month rather, um, for treatment. And I think that is, it is much more comfortable. I've seen uh, a few, not many, but a few patients who have had bad outcomes from their treatment and it's always been poorly uh, developed treatment plans, unfortunately. Thank you. That has been Thank really you. useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Marian or Dr. Ani, who is introducing okay. sir? Okay, I, I didn't unmute. So let me, now can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, Dr. Grover, who is familiar in, in all our uh, All India meetings, and we always look forward to his talks and his videos. He's the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology, Sri Gangaram Hospital, and Vision Eye Center, New Delhi, and also the recipient of the prestigious Patmasri Award by the President of India. He is the president of the South Asian Association for SARC Oculoplastic Society. And he is a board member of Afro-Asian uh, Council of Ophthalmology and past president of uh, Asia Pacific uh, Society of Oculoplastic and uh, Reconstructive Surgery and uh, AAOS and OPA. So let's uh, go on to his talk. A 
good evening. Um, thank you, Cochin of Thalmec Society, Santosh, and all of you for this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this prestigious webinar. And I've really enjoyed being a part of this session. Thanks for your introduction. I'm going to speak on the current protocols for management of socket abnormalities. Before we go to abnormalities, let's look at what is an aesthetically and functionally acceptable anophthalmic socket. You need an adequate epithelium lined, healthy epithelium lined socket, eyelids of normal length, appearance and tone, and an implant which is well centered. You also need to have a well fitted prosthesis there being no volume loss or enophthalmos or sulcus deformity. And the prosthesis should transmit the motility well to give an aesthetic appearance of good quality. Now let's look at the abnormalities of the anophthalmic socket. Literature research, uh, literature, uh, search shows us that some of the common problems are those related to symptoms of secretions infections, foreign body reactions, or even pain. The other problems include conjunctival cysts and ptosis of the upper lid is a common problem, almost one-tenth to one-fourth of the cases. The other problems include those of erosion or thinning of conjunctiva, Sometimes implant dislocations, migrations, or even extrusions. The other problems pertain to those which cause fibrosis or adhesions and contraction of the phonuses, leading to difficulty in retention of the prosthesis. Appropriate evaluation holds the key to making an appropriate plan of management. Symptomatology is important, including the appearance that is offered, the symptoms, and the inability to retain prosthesis, and what has gone on in the past, including what the cause of removal of the eye or loss of eye was, what kind of implant had been placed, whether there has been an irradiation, and how well or where and where and how the prosthesis was fitted. The components that you particularly look for are whether there is a volume deficit leading to enophthalmos or sulcus deformity, how healthy or unhealthy the surface is in terms of inflammation, congestion, and in terms of contraction and surface abnormalities, which we will talk about later, presence or status of the implant, the status of the eyelids, laxity, loss of tone, and about the prosthesis. We largely talk about contracted sockets when we talk about the management of socket. However, there is much more to sockets than just contraction. And we go about some of these as well. Let's deal with some of these problems. Loss of volume is a very significant problem. And this leads also to the so-called sulcus deformity. The commonest cause of loss of volume is either the implant was not placed or a small implant was placed, or there has been a later atrophy or a change in the position of the orbital contents because of gravity. Migration of implant is another problem and lower lid sagging also contributes to the loss of volume in the appropriate position. The enophthalmos is often corrected by replacement of volume, either as secondary implants or replacement of the implants, dermis fat drafts, fat drafting, and sometimes subperiosteal implants. Sulcus deformity in particular needs extra attention besides volume replacement with sometimes placement of some tissues in the area of the sulcus deformity. One of the other common problems is the so-called lax socket or the inferior phonics shelving, 
which causes a difficulty in retention of the prosthesis, even though there is no shortage of the surface. This is essentially because of shifting of tissues within the orbit and involutional relaxation of the eyelid supports. The effect of a heavy prosthesis where it may be needed because the volume replacement was inadequate often also contributes to the so-called shelving. What you observe on pinching the lid is that there is enough surface available, but still there is a poor inferior phonics which does not retain the prosthesis well. Many of these cases would do well just with eyelid tight tightening, but you need to form inferior phonics in most of the people either without creating an incision and opening up or opening it up to create a raw area for the adhesions to form when you want to form your inferior phonics. So the lateral tarsal strip procedure is the commonest procedure that is done for tightening, but phonics forming sutures either by looking at the appropriate position for creating the phonics, you would put your conformer in, identify the position from where the phonics needs to be formed and create adhesions with the inferior periosteum, periorbita and periosteum to create the phonics and tie it over bolsters which are retained for a couple of weeks. But addition of a lateral incision to make this area raw and using a scissors to dissect up to the margin and up to the orbital margin adds to the efficacy of this procedure by creating a raw area where and I, we identify the position where the inferior phonics needs to be formed and placement of the sutures after that becomes more effective. An example is a shell phonics here with upward displaced prosthesis where phonics forming sutures by open method did help us to retain the prosthesis well. Implant extrusions and exposures are another problem and hydroxyapatite has been one material which has contributed a lot to the exposures and that's the reason why it has become less possible, uh, less uh, popular. Some of the earlier implants such as the Allens or other implants which were non-spherical had a much higher rate of extrusion. And this extrusion could be early related to surgical factors or late due to late fibrous contractions. The implants, when they were partially extruded, could be removed and replaced either as primary or secondary procedures if there was infection at the time of primary surgery. But exposure of hydroxyapatite problem uh, implants has been a more difficult problem. Sometimes they can be treated conservatively and for infected cases, you need to wait till the infection settles and then you can usually do a trimming of the exposed implant and place a scleral or a fascia lata graft. We've done a trimming here and tried to place a scleral graft in position. You try and bury the scleral graft under the tissue of conjunctiva so that it can get epithelized and covered over by conjunctival tissue in the due course of time. But it doesn't always work. Sometimes you get inclusion cysts in conjunctiva and granulation tissues due to chronic irritation or sometimes due to an ill-fitting prosthesis are some of the other problems. And these often need to be excised to get a healthy surface. Otherwise, they lead to considerable discharge and scarring. Scarring may lead to simbleferon or fibrous band formation. And sometimes the procedures which can cause a reorientation of the tissue may work. But in other cases, you may require a graft. So a fibrous band like this with a, unit, with a direction of contraction can sometimes be amenable to a Z-plasty with reorientation of the tissues Combined with a, a lateral canthal tightening, you are able to create enough surface sometimes to retain a good prosthesis uh, without having to resort to a mucous membrane graft in presence of so much scarring. But contracted sockets are by far 
a much more common problems with severity varying from mild to moderate to severe. Early socket contraction is often related to the cause of the initial loss of the eye or to the surgery or to use of radiation. And absence of use of conformers or prosthesis in the early post-operative period or use of poorly fitting or rough prosthesis. Whereas the late socket contraction is often the result of chronic inflammation or non-use of prosthesis for long periods of time. Mild socket contractions usually would only result in some problems in the position, drooping, non inability to close the eye or an entropion, and these may sometimes be managed by smaller measures like tarsal rotation procedures. But those which are uh, more severe amongst these may require some mucous membrane grafting. Moderate contracted sockets show contraction both of inferior, superior, or both furnaces, with the greater impact being the shortage of the inferior phonics. These result in enophthalmos with posteriorly displaced prosthesis, as you can see, poor motility, loss of normal lid fold, persistent discharge and irritation, and inability to retain the prosthesis. So this is an example of a moderately contracted socket, which shows up many of the difficulties we have spoken about. Sometimes, a modification of the prosthesis works, but most cases do require a surgical management with moderate contraction. And mucous membrane grafting has been the go-to procedure in most cases. We use the buccal or lip mucosa most often, and phonics formation in these cases is critical. Excision of the scar is important, and immediate placement of conformer is important. An example is this, where we make a horizontal incision from one uh, canthus to the other, carry out an adequate dissection extending up to the bony margin as well as up to the eyelid margin to create an adequate area for graft placement. And I prefer to take a reasonably large graft, much larger than what uh, the defect is at the moment, and place the excess by uh, spreading it out evenly. So graft is sutured in position. It is important to create the phonuses by phonics forming sutures and place the conformer at the end. Previously operated ones present much more difficulty, much more fibrosis, and you may need to take graft from another location because the lip has been used earlier. So we're using the mucosa from the cheek here and at the end of the procedure, you can get adequate volume to be able to place a prosthesis, even though motility may not be extremely good. Amniotic membrane gra grafting has been used, but remember that it is only a substrate and not a substitute graft and work in a limited way. The results have been good in some series, but there have been some problems in other series. If there is a loss of volume associated with contracted socket, dermis fat grafting offers a good alternative and harvesting from the lateral aspect of the buttock with enough volume of, of, of the fat works well in many cases with results that can be gratifying. Although you need a good vascular bed and Cases with previous radiation or extensive scarring may sometimes not take up. Severe cases may be extremely difficult where you sometimes you are left just with a slit. And mucosa may not suffice, even though that may be desirable in a wet socket. But those with a dry socket, split thickness, skin grafts sometimes are able to provide you that space to put in a prosthesis. This was a girl with retinoblastoma who had a grossly contracted socket 
a smaller bony socket as well following irradiation and an epidermal graft was able to give her some kind of a socket to retain a prosthesis. She's recently undergone a formation of the lateral phonics as well. I still don't have the photographs. Some of the desperate cases you can use flaps with intact vascular supply and amongst other areas, a radial artery forearm flaps have been used and no personal experience with these. But in desperate cases, you may just need to use an orbital or spectacle prosthesis. And um, so you need to distinguish between those with volume deficit and with those without any volume deficit. And you're able to tackle them well with smaller procedures. Moist cases would require mucous membrane grafts, whereas those which are dry would need a skin graft. Those with volume deficit would either need a dermis fat graft or a graft of mucosa combined with an implant. So with appropriate planning and choice of procedure, most cases of socket abnormalities can be helped to achieve a reasonable cosmesis and a good psychological rehabilitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Grover. Very nice and detailed lecture. Ganga, do you have any quick comments? Nothing at all. The only comment is I know the membership in OPA has been growing because the people you all trained over the years. With now good oculoplastic surgeons around the country, over the past 10, 15 years, have you seen a reduced incidence of these contracted sockets? Yeah, the way they do enucleation has improved and the use of implants, primary implants of adequate size. So all that has contributed, I suppose. So yeah. have you seen a reduced incidence to Grover? Yes, I think there is a huge qualitative change in how oculoplastics is practiced and a number of secondary problems that we saw have really come down. I think Santosh has been a great source of education and uh, um, a lot of others have contributed, Usha and a lot of others have contributed very significantly. You have played a major role by coming to us regularly and uh, made a huge difference to the standards of uh, education. I think the fellowship programs in the country have improved a lot and there are a lot more people who have gone abroad as well and brought in much more improved quality of work to the country. I think we have, uh, uh, when we started the Oculoplastic Association of India as, as the organizing, as the founding secretary 31 years ago, we were a handful of 10 people and used to do a two-hour session with a guest speaker and today we hold sessions where there are so many good speakers that you can hardly accommodate more than one talk for anybody else. So a huge qualitative change and uh, 31 years of OPI has been a uh, dream journey. So I would like to compliment all the OPI leaders and the members. That's all I wanted to do here. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It has been a real pleasure hearing Dr. Ashok Grover. Now over to the last man standing, Dr. Santosh Khadawan. So as uh, chairman, he had shifted his talk to the last. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. If you're not sleepy, I'll... Best for the last. I'll very briefly cover the current management of ocular surface tumors. I'll try to cover... Uh... Am I audible? Yeah. So, uh, recent advances in diagnosis, topical treatment, surgical management, a bit of radiation and target therapy. Now, imaging, of course, I'm speaking to some of the retina specialists here. OCT has been a game changer in the management of medical retina. And so is it in the in case of ocular surface tumors. Wonder how. Look at this particular pigmented conjunctival nevus. There are several clinical criteria with which it can be diagnosed as a nevus. But if you have any diagnostic dilemma at all, simply do a UBM or anterior segment OCT and you will be able to find this microcyst or macrocyst, which is very diagnostic of a nevus. Melanoma will be solid, whereas nevus will be spongy. Example is this doctor's son who is just 11 year old, who has developed a fleshy pigment, non-pigmented lesion with a feeder vessel and a lot of intrinsic vasculature. 
Now there's a diagnostic dilemma. It is also encroaching slightly onto the limbus. You can see that. So how did we solve this? We simply did imaging and we found microcyst. It's an amelanotic nevus. So presence of microcyst indicates that it is a nevus. Now, if you have a patient who always had a nevus and recently have noted that there's a change in the color, texture, or the size of the lesion. Of course, this is very dramatic. This patient always had a nevus here from which this large lesion grew. But I'll use this dramatic case to illustrate one important point, that there is a change in the OCT. You can see that when we did UBM or OCT in this patient, the solid component conforms to the new melanoma, whereas the cystic component conforms to nevus. So this is correlatable on histopathology as well. So it is diagnostic. So if you have a patient who has what looks like OSSN, of course, there are clinical factors such as keratin, Rose Bengal stain, and abnormal vascularity. But if you have any doubt at all, for example, if a lesion looks very funny, like an inflamed pterygium, pingicula, or a conjunctival infection or scar, then you can do anterior segment OCT. This criteria were described by Carol Karp, who uh, from Baskin Parma has shown that hypoplastic hyperreflective corneal epithelium, which ends abruptly like a snout. This is the normal corneal epithelium, which is grayish. This is hyperplastic and hyperreflective, and it's abruptly ending with a snout that is diagnostic of OSSN. So I can know the depth of the lesion as well. For example, this patient has tenons spared, so your plane of dissection can simply be subtenons. You know the level of the lesion before doing surgery. Illustrated in this patient where there is corneal oasis, and you can see that the stroma is thickened in this area, whereas this is the normal stroma. So surgery will not help this patient with ex excision. He'll need a keratoplasty or plaque brachytherapy. Patients who have anterior segment extension, such as to the iris angle and the ciliary body, can be diagnosed preoperatively with anterior segment imaging. And add to that, we have invaded the territory of ret retinal specialists a bit more by using OCD angiography for conjunctival ana vasculature analysis. This may help, uh, you know, predict the area of local tumor recurrence, especially when we use topical therapy instead of, uh, say, radical surgery. Now, going on to topical therapy itself, there are chemotherapeutic agents, mitomycin, 5-FUR, chemotherapeutic agents. But what we now have is a very gentle immunotherapy that is interferon. Let's look at some of the indications. Before that, the cost, of course, I want to stress that 5FU is least expensive. Myotomycin and interferon cost almost the same, and interferon is currently easily available in India. There are three ways in which it can be used. One is for complete tumor control, that is called immunotherapy. Reduction in tumor size before you want to do surgery, that is immunoreduction. It's a way of doing neoadjuvant therapy where surgery is the endpoint. Immunomodulation is to modulate the ocular surface to enhance the local immune system so that the patient does not have local tumor recurrence. Let's look at immunotherapy and its indications. If you have a very small tumor like this, either you can do surgery or use topical therapy. The advantage of topical therapy is that there is absolutely no scar in the area where the tumor was. Limbal integrity is maintained and there is no vascularization of the peripheral cornea. Or in a patient with corneal OSSN, this is pre-interferon uh, era. This was in the time of uh, mitomycin. When my cornea specialist friend had done a biopsy from this area before he sent over, had sent over the patient to me. And three years later, after having used topical mitomycin, you can see that that is the area where he had done biopsy is where there is corneal scar. Rest of the cornea is absolutely clear. So this tells us that if you were to do primary surgery in a patient with corneal oasis, and you might leave a bit of scar in the pupillary axis, thus precluding 20-20 and 6 vision, and instead use topical therapy. Clear example where topical therapy should be used. One more example, this is a patient with xeroderma pigmentosum. This is a precious corneal graph for this patient, second graph or the third graph, on top of which are the graft host junction, there is a OSSN. Xeroderma pa patients are predisposed to OSSN. And this unfortunately has developed at the precious graft host junction. Surgery, of course, is possible, but if you were to do surgery, you might tip the balance in favor of, say, graft rejection or, um, you know, um, even a graft failure. But instead of that, using gentle interferon, resolve the 
situation and the patient has no residual tumor left in that area. Patients who have more than six clock hours of limbal affection. This is a clear situation where there could be limbal stem cell deficiency. Six clock hours of limbus is not easy to um, you know, operate where uh, you, you would not leave with even a little bit of limbal stem cell deficiency. Instead of surgery, you could use topical interferon and you can see a nice limbal barrier maintained without any corneal uh, problem at all. Or a diffuse OSS and where almost the entire ocular surface, including the phonicial conjunctiva is involved, goes away very nicely with topical interferon. So what I'm showing you are cases where the tumor height is not much. Tumor is not nodular and the tumor is more placoid. These are the situations where topical therapy works best. And if you have a nodular localized tumor, then maybe you are better off with surgery. The last example is a diffuse OSSN where in the only seeing eye of this patient, he has the entire ocular surface involved with OSSN, including the palpable conjunctiva and the lid margin. A clear case for orbital eccentration. But here we used injection interferon, multiple injections followed by topical therapy. And a few years later, MAP biopsy confirms that he has complete resolution of OSSN with good vision maintained. This is an HIV seropositive patient with diffuse OSSN, again treated with injection interferon. So we can use interferon in the form of drops and injection. And it's a very good alternative to mitomycin and 5 fluoroacetyl comes somewhere in between. What is immunoreduction? If you were to begin with a tumor this large, of course you can do surgery, but short of it, you can reduce the tumor to this small a size by pre-treating the treatment patient with topical therapy. How does this actually work? If this is the cornea and this is the limbus and that is the epicenter of the tumor and that is the rest of the tumor. Now, epicenter of the tumor is generally invasive squamous cell carcinoma. It is surrounded by a zone of carcinoma in situ and severe, moderate and mild dysplasia. Topical therapy works on carcinoma in situ and dysplasia, leaving the invasive tumor behind. So, and that is what you need to surgically operate and finally remove. So your area of surgery is much less if you were to use new adjuvant chemotherapy. The immunomodulation is used for patients who have a high risk for local tumor recurrence or new onset tumors such as xeroderma pigmentosum or HIV seropositive patients where it can be safely used once a day dose for um, indefinite period of time. So the advantages of topical chemotherapy are that it is definitely non-invasive, scar-free healing, so reduced incidence of limbal simple deficiency, but it is more expensive as compared to one-time surgery. And what is most important is commitment on part of the patient for compliance. There are clear indications for topical therapy and surgical indications are also clear. And there is good new knowledge which uh, helps us decide between topical therapy and surgical therapy as primary modalities. When we talk about surgery, we always talk about excision with tumor-free margin. Four millimeter clinically clear tumor-free margins after having used Rose Bengal for subclinical component of the tumor is what we um, excise. And for the corneal epithelial component, we use alcohol-assisted keratoepithelectomy. Cryotherapy to the resection edges mandatory. Let's look at this video clip where a small OSSN is being excised. You can see that my excision edge is way beyond what is clinically seen. The yellow mark indicates the area where Rose Bengal was positive, which is again beyond what is clinically evident. Use of Rose Bengal tells you what is subclinical. Any area of the conjunctiva that is stained is included beyond that four millimeter. Now, excision can be performed with scissor as well as RF. RF is better because it minimizes bleeding and plane of dissection is very crisp and clear with radio frequency electrode. That's the limbus that's been reached from the conjunctival side. Then you apply absolute alcohol ahead of the corneal epithelial component for about 15 to 20 seconds until the epithelium turns subtle gray. Then you scroll off the corneal epithelium of the Bowman's membrane without injuring the Bowman's membrane to reach the limbus from the corneal epithelial side. And the final step is limbectomy. Limbectomy, superficial limbectomy is mandatory because OSSN is a tumor of the limbal stem cells. So you have to excise limbus very superficially so to get rid of the epicenter or the origin of the tumor itself. And that's done under visualization. 
you have to see exactly what you're doing and if the tumor is going slightly deeper you have to go a little deeper as well very very controlled excision under microscope that is excision edge cryotherapy where the edge of the conjunctiva is draped over a three millimeter tip cryoprobe and frozen twice and spontaneously thawed double freeze thaw cryotherapy for the entire excision edge base cryotherapy is not mandatory but if you feel that clinically during surgery that a couple of clock hours or up to three clock hours of the limbus is involved, which you have spared during surgery and not gone deeper, there you can do a base cryotherapy. Restrict to three clock hours, otherwise you risk limbal stem cell deficiency. That completes the excision part. Now we have to reconstruct either using a conjunctival autograph or you can use an amniotic membrane. Now, amniotic membrane is uh, easily available and uh, you don't have to operate on another area of the same patient's eye or another eye to harvest conjunctival graft it can simply be glued on using a, a seal glue or it can be sutured as well with a very nice ocular surface reconstruction so you don't have to worry about uh, complications such as limbal stem cell deficiency as you see here six clock hours of tumor excised yet there is no limbal stem cell deficiency and you can do OCT guided technique where OCT actually correlates with histopathology if you're not sure of the depth. If you have an extensive tumor where you fear that there might be limbal stem cell deficiency, a primary simple limbal epithelial transplantation actually helps. This prevents the occurrence of limbal stem cell deficiency and conjunctivalization of the cornea. Surgery remains an excellent option, but there are situations where you need to give adjuvant therapy following surgery. If the resection edge is positive and the patient has only carcinoma in situ or dysplasia, if you have done edge cryotherapy, then observation is acceptable. If you have not done edge cryotherapy, then patient has to be provided topical chemotherapy or immunotherapy. If the resection edge is positive and it has invasive squamous cell carcinoma, then at least medical legally you are mandated to re-excise because invasive squamous cell carcinoma does not respond to topical therapy. If resection base is positive and if it's localized and the pathologist can tell you that this particular clock hour is involved, you can cryo it if it's a couple of clock hours. If resection base is positive and if it is diffuse, then you have no option either to re-excise or do plaque pachytherapy. Immunomodulation is for patients who are prone to local tumor recurrence. Now, beyond surgery, what do we have? Patients who have scleral extension were earlier enucleated or were subjected to extended enucleation. For these patients, we have plaque brachytherapy. Now, plaque can be done in two ways. One is secondary plaque brachytherapy when after confirmation on histopathology that the scleral base is involved, you apply plaque. These are all patients who have undergone secondary plaque brachytherapy, which is the standard approach. If you have histopathology confirmation, then you go ahead and do plaque. And it works very well. But in situations where you cannot do surgery at all, like the stromal melt situation, but you want to save the eye because patient has potentially good vision, you know that the tumor has extended to involve the corneal stroma and superficial sclera. You can't do surgery because you lose the tectonic integrity of the eye. Then you can do primary plaque brachytherapy and it seems to work very well. So you can actually perform primary plaque brachytherapy wherever it is feasible. Patients who have corneal stromal invasion are clear indications for primary plaque brachytherapy, either which case it gives uh, about 90% success in eye salvage. So can we salvage, um, say, an advanced situation? This is a patient where um, elsewhere multiple surgeries have been performed and finally there is intraocular extension. Young patient who has 20, who had 20, on record 2040 vision, now he has a developed intraocular extension and has retinal detachment. You would enucleate this earlier, but now we can do a very nice planned stereotactic radiation, which is chemo radiation. You give a cisplatin as the radio sensitizer and deliver a moderate amount of radiation, 4000 or 4500 centigrade. Very well planned radiation so that the uh, patient's visual uh, potential is maintained, realized. And you can see that the retinal detachment has settled and uh, the intrascleral and intraocular component have regressed. As you see on uh, ultrasound B scan, it's gone. And on UBM, it's gone. So you have uh, 
planned multimodal treatment for salvaging the unsalvageable. So this is an extensive ocular surface melanoma, melanoma involving the almost the entire ocular surface with intraocular extension. Patient is very keen on eye salvage and you know that orbital excentration or local excision does not really matter in terms of conjunctival melanoma metastasizing to regional lymph nodes. So we can actually try to save this eye and that is only possible by using rotational plaque technique where the entire ocular surface was covered by placing the plaque in those quadrants on three uh, consecutive occasions and the patient see at the end of uh, about six months of follow-up is completely free of ocular surface tumor. Uh, vaporization of conjunctival tumors is possible either with carbon dioxide laser or uh, say even RF electrode. This is a patient with conjunctival lymphangioma. Bleomycin is difficult here because of corneal epithelial toxicity. Excision is possible. It can be bloody. Short of that, you can vaporize this and relay the ocular surface with amniotic membrane and this is how the patient looks. This is an extensive conjunctival lymphangioma again treated with uh, RF assisted vaporization and uh, relaying of the ocular surface with amniotic membrane. Last bit is about the target therapy. Target therapy could be using uh, injections such as rituximab in patients with uh, lymphoma. This is a patient with lymphoma in the superior fornix, but you can also see that it is extending along the eye posteriorly. You can do radiation for the residual component. You can't go so far back around the eye and excise it. So what we have done is excise the anterior component, which was safe to excise. And for the posterior component, we have given perilesional rituximab, 5 milligram per ml, 6 injections every 3 weeks, and it worked very well in this patient. For uh, conjunctival melanoma, we have the mutational spectrum entirely worked up. And for each specific mutation, we have target therapy. And uh, data is appearing in the literature about the use of pembrolizumab in patients who have regional lymph node metastasis. Nivolumab, and we had an experience with this patient who had regional lymph node metastasis for which he was given nivolumab and he had ocular surface melanoma recurring as well. After three months of use of this target therapy, his ocular surface is cleared up completely. So there is a case for using target therapy. Of course, it's very expensive currently, but if it's made reasonable in terms of cost and it's made available, to use these as primary treatment instead of surgery for extensive lesions, which is uh, you know being explored at this point in time. So in conclusion, I would say that a lot of advances in the management of ocular surface tumors, including the diagnosis using anterior segment OCT and OCT angiography, target therapy, innovative use of radiation have shown much better outcomes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Santosh. Grover, sir. As always, you'll, you're left speechless at the end of uh, Santosh's <laughs> talk. It's presented so beautifully and the kind of uh, pioneering work that he adds on, taking on the most difficult cases and uh, taking them to a level, taking treatment to a level which has not been achieved before. I think it's Really an exceptional one. Thanks. Dr. Gopal, can, can I ask a question? Sure, please. So, excellent presentation as always. So, I have two questions for you. One is regarding, this is a common thing that, you know, as a general practitioner or a general ophthalmologist, regarding PAM, primary acquired melanosis. So, when would you uh, plan to treat or intervene? And what would you, what would be the best intervention that you would consider for primary acquired melanosis? If it's localized spam, I would excise it, one quadrant. If it is diffuse spam, I would do a map biopsy and see if there is any cellular atypia. If the patient has cellular atypia, the first line of treatment, of course, is surgical excision of the entire lesion, if that is feasible. If that is not feasible, then you can excise what is possible to excise in rest of the areas. You can do reverse cryotherapy, you can do peritomy and treat the conjunctiva from the bottom top. And in extensive situations where you cannot excise, you can't even do cryotherapy, there are situations where 360 degree of the ocular surface, the entire ocular surface may be involved. Then you can use topical mitomycin, which seems to work better than 5-fluorouracil. And of course, interferon has no role here. 
So thought of that, you have to watch these patients very, very regularly because they may develop a conjunctival melanoma anywhere. And so examination of the superior phonics and inferior phonics at every visit and lacrimal syringing to see if they have developed any lacrimal sac melanoma, which we know because there is something called oncoria, are important during follow-up. So if a patient doesn't respond to any of these and if the patient has multiple melanoma recurrences, then you can do 360-degree plaque breakage the precious eye. Otherwise, you can opt for orbital excentration. So would you excise even a localized one, one clock hour PAM or you would uh, just kind one of... One clock hour, you know, it is okay to observe one clock hour PAM. But anything more than that, every clock hour adds to risk. Okay. That, you know, 1.7 times is the odds ratio for every clock hour extent of the lesion. Mm -hmm. So one clock hour, you can opt to observe, but I would even excise that, you know, if a patient is not reliable for follow-up, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. anything more than one clock hour is a definite indication for excision. Okay. All right. And so what is your experience with uh, posterior lamella resection in case of diffuse OSSN? Would you even consider that? But well, we have interferon and you've shown excellent results with it, but yeah. have you had landed up doing that? Posterior lamella excision is okay for one of the lids. If you have both the lids involved, then it becomes very challenging to reconstruct. You can do it, but I would do that for one one lid, upper or lower posterior lamella excision. Or if you, if you need posterior lamella excision for both the lids, then you would have to stage it. So I would exhaust all other options before I try that. And the new plug that is being developed by BARC, which looks like exactly like a simulatron ring. Mm -hmm. where both the surfaces of the plaque, you know, uh, are uh, coated with ruthenium would be an extensive, would be an excellent uh, resource for treating the entire ocular surface. So the need for doing posterior lamellar dissection could possibly be eliminated with this new plaque that is almost, uh, you know, in the stage of development. Mm -hmm. It should be available very soon. Okay. In, in cases of seroderma, if it's not responding to interferon alpha, what would be your next choice of topical therapy? Zeroderma mitomycin is okay, but mitomycin cannot be tolerated by zeroderma patients very well. They have already dry eye and bad ocular surface. So it's best to use 5-fluoroacyl. 5-FU is the kind of a good alternative to uh, interferon as well as mitomycin. It works very well. At the same time, it is least toxic to the ocular surface as compared to mitomas. So I have one more question. Going back to PAM, sir, what do you think about cryotherapy for PAM? I talked about cryotherapy, right? Reverse cryotherapy. Reverse. Oh, you go down and then do yeah. Not over you, the surface? You can do so at the surface, but you don't know, know the end point. You know, have you gone deep enough? Oh. So as Dr. Shields has taught us, if you do peritomy, in the area where there is pan and go from bottom to top, you know, at the exact end point of traffic. Okay. You would have treated the full thickness. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Santosh. <laughs> You're the last man standing. The uh, we are that the was best, the last the talk of the, the last <laughs> session of our world webinar of ophthalmic revisions. This is the seventh, uh, uh, seventh module. So, Dr. Sai, you can. I mean, it was it has been a wonderful three days going through all the. We also learned a lot, uh, you know, in in all the not even outside our own areas of comfort and our own subspecialties, and definitely the 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 last session was the best, and I'm amazed at the number of international speakers Dr. Santosh has managed to bring into into this. Thank you so much for that. I mean, it's virtually the the who is who in in oncology, orbit, fantastic. So uh, I think um, uh, we have to, you know, thank uh, our uh, KSOS president, Dr. Babu Krishna Kumar, who has uh, come in. Uh, just a few words uh, of thanks. Uh, small valedictory function. Uh, we have our general secretary, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, we have Rajiv Sukumaran, the chairman scientific committee of the KSOS. And of course, we have uh, Mr. Raju and Mr. Sajan from uh, Milmet Division of Sun Pharma, who, who are also uh, present here. They have been very supportive uh, right from the concept stage to the implementation till today. Uh, 
uh, babu sir you want to speak a few words okay respected seniors dear friends faculties international and national delegates uh, dr mahesh dr um, rajiv sugumaran dr sai kumar and dr gopal amazing is the single word to address your task in conducting a cme world webinar of ophthalmology revision 2021 each of the seven modules you scheduled during three days of exploration into the subject of ophthalmology was all comprehensive communicative and simple in format the cme is very popular from pgs to professors is expressed in web media groups kaisers appreciates a true world class cme by coc participating 91 faculties that to topmost in their sub specialty we are looking forward to such cmes of tremendous caliber from coc in future too even though the pandemic has brought many calamities this webinar by coc is a blessing along with it let me congratulate the leaders dr sai kumar president coaching of thalmi club dr gopal secretary coaching of thalmi club and the team coc for escalating new our heights thank you thank you thank you so much sir uh, mahesh are you there yeah 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 okay uh, it was a, a wonderful effort by cochino ophthalmic club and uh, ksos uh, is happy to be associated with it uh, literally uh, dr sai and dr gobal mainly uh, has taken this pains and i think he is sitting in front of the laptop for the past uh, 48 hours no i think uh, gobal mainly so mainly wonderful. gobal <laughs> yeah yeah so and it was uh, i hope it will be available in the website uh, cochino club club website for uh, some more time so that we can yes, uh, yes. see the missing and the uh, and the youtube channel as well yeah yeah so that will be very useful uh, for all the post graduates and uh, as a revision uh, fantastic effort coc probably leads ksos and uh, not only ksos across india one of the most active uh, probably district club in uh, india congrats coc and uh, best wishes for future endeavors also thank you dr rajiv yes good evening all we are coming to the end of a wonderful uh, academic feast and uh, i can tell you one thing the tenure of uh, dr sai and dr gopal will be written in golden words in the history of ksos such a beautiful program they are doing and uh, I, I am just wondering, as uh, coaching of Thalmi Club, they are doing this much. The same team is going to take up KSOs. I don't know where it will go. World class, a universal class. More than a world class, it's going to be a universal class. Okay, wish you all the very best. And I should thank uh, Mr. Naufel and Mr. Arun who helped us in the last minute to come out with the website. And uh, with all the problems, they could manage to do it. and uh, i should thank them for that with this let's uh, enjoy a good night after this uh, mr raju from sun pharma you want to speak something very really respected doctors and all colleagues uh, it is a great opportunity to given to us uh, to uh, support the cochin of thalmic society when gobal sir last year when he is given come with this uh, project we thought it is a difficult to uh, implement in that but his dedication and sir support made it is a wonderful uh, session and last year it is made the standard this year overwhelmed with the support in that and the participation so it was a, a given us a opportunity to support this scientific program we are greatly privileged and honored so we will like to continue this support for the whatever the scientific activities for either the coc or ksos we are happy to continue with the support thank you very much sir thank you so much gopal the stage is yours for the final oh, thomas sir and well yeah yeah thanks. thomas is here yeah yeah okay respected seniors and uh, uh, fact senior governing body members of uh, ksos our president babu krishnamurthy secretary Dr. Mahesh, Scientific Committee Chairman Dr. Rajiv Subbaran, COC President Dr. Sai Kumar, Secretary Dr. Gopal, all senior faculty from across the world. It has been a real treat 
um, and uh, you can just imagine the amount of work that has gone behind it and it's it is purely dr sai and dr gopal who have worked out for uh, for months really planning planning this and uh, i'm sure the all the few all ophthalmologists and also postgraduate students will benefit uh, going through this as as dr sai said the who's who of ophthalmology who have in each specialty they have really enlightened us and uh, i even though i practice glaucoma and neuroophthalmology i do uh, uh, work as a comprehensive ophthalmologist and really it has been a real learning experience and i thank you all for kind of taking the time especially from different parts of the world at awkward hours and uh, and, and enlightening us over the last two and a half days thank you so thank you all it had been a tremendous the winner is ophthalmology and all the comprehensive ophthalmologists and i thank my postgraduates who have actually helped me run this program and uh, 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 really appreciate all the hard work. Thank you what very is, much. What is the number of uh, YouTube uh, viewers? Total so about 8,000 viewers have seen the whole program all together. Uh, I, so hope, I hope it will, I mean, the increase. coming weeks it will, it will definitely increase. Yeah, yeah. Happy congratulations for all the hard work. I'm you. sure there has been a lot of efforts behind this. Yes, <laughs> Sai and Gopal. Wonderful work. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.